Okay, I think I think now we have all our panelists. We are ready to start. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the last day of this curiously protracted SES meeting, the panel on pagans and Christians. Um, I am Catherine Conybar. I'm from Bryn Mawr College. I'm chairing the panel today. I am enjoined to remind you all of the norms of courteous and respectful Zoom behavior with which you're all well familiar by now. I imagine um, please don't record the session. Please, if using the chat device, which is open to all participants, please use chat only for questions or comments related directly to the session. Um, and obviously not rude ones. Um, at the end, each, each paper will have its own time slot. They're quite um, a various set of papers, as, as you know. So the expectation will be each speaker has a half an hour time slot. They will speak for, I trust, pretty precisely 20 minutes um, and then have eight to 10 minutes for questions before we move on to the next speaker. That also means that there will be a little time left at the end for, as it were, clearing house questions if there's something that you didn't get a chance to ask one of the speakers or if you have perceived a thread that ties different talks together. Please use that time um, as an opportunity to ask that question. I would, I'm delighted to see that some of the audience has its cameras on. Um, may I encourage as many of you as are willing to turn your cameras on because it's very odd for the speakers if people's cameras aren't on. It's like speaking in an empty room. Um, so unless you're in the shower, which we don't, we don't want to know, but if you can, if you can um, turn your camera on, I'd be very grateful. So with, with that, with those preliminaries, um, I would like to start with our first speaker, um, Matthias Gassmann from the University of Oxford, who is going to speak to us on the Libri Pontificales at the end of paganism. Matthias. Thank you, Catherine. I will have to begin by uh, apologizing for having failed to translate the first very brief sentence in your handouts. So there's a little bit of confusion in the wording there. Um, doesn't really change the meaning and we should be able to go ahead here. Tucked away in a recess of Augustine's vast corpus is an account of a conversation held one morning before church with some members of his congregation. These men drew Augustine's attention to a wrinkle in Christianity's progress through the Roman world. Why had oracles been able to predict the downfall of pagan temples? Augustine's answer was simple. The demons were no doubt aware of their impending doom. The men, however, would not accept it. In reply, they offered a spirited defense of traditional religion. Central to a case that ebbs and shifts under Augustine's counterblasts is an insistence on the moral propriety of public cult. Having once been allowed by the omnipotent God, the public sacra must have been pleasing to him. The men's last resort, before they caved under pressure for time, was to that elusive mirage of Roman religious history, the Libri Pontificales. Dismissing contemporary, private paganism, they asserted the authority of the pontiff's books to determine properly traditional practice. Now I quote from Augustine, the first quote on your handout, quotation on your handout. Those rites, they said, do not take place at all, which were written down in the pontifical books. They did in fact then take place rightly and are shown then to have been pleasing to God by the very fact that they were allowed by the omnipotent and just, this uh, uh, sort of designation for God, omnipotence, it used to appears over and over again, were allowed by the omnipotent and just to take place. But if any of the prohibited sacrifices takes place now in secret and against the law, it is not to be compared to that pontifical kind of sacrifices but to be reckoned in that category which takes place at nighttime, since it is certain that all these unlawful rites are prohibited and condemned by the pontifical books themselves. This extraordinary argument has gone virtually without comment. In answer to the original question about pagan oracles, the essay on the divination of demons falls in an awkward interstice in Augustine's career. 
written to all appearances between about 406 and the Gothic sack of Rome in 410, has been overshadowed, naturally enough, by City of God, and omitted from Georg Groda's invaluable sur survey in the Libra Pontificales, has received even less attention from classicists than from Augustinian specialists. Averring only that nocturnal worship had long been forbidden, Augustine's lay interlocutors add little to the murky and inconclusive information handed down about the books of the pontifices and their role, if they indeed had any, in Roman worship, a thing for which I would uh, advise turning to John North's article, which I've listed on the handout. Their argument is nonetheless, or so I will argue, a valuable witness to the perception of the public sacra during their terminal decline in the Roman cities of North Africa. The first thing to recognize is that the laymen are not, or at least Augustine would have us believe that they are not presenting their own opinion. The few commentators uh, who have said anything much about it have seen the laymen as Christians less well instructed, that's the older view we might say, or at least less dogmatically Christian in their attitudes than was their bishop. But in any case, sincerely representing their own view. Peter Brown has put it thus, leading members of Augustine's congregation opined that rites which had been performed throughout Roman history, according to the ritual codes laid down by the Libri Pontificales, must have enjoyed the tacit favor of God. Pagan worship was a form of supplementary Old Testament. Brown describes the argument quite well, but fails, I think, to capture the tenor of the situation. Although Augustine injects a little uncertainty with the layman's motivations, he suggests that they were playing, to use a later metaphor, the devil's advocate, seeking rather through contradiction to ask what answer they should give to pagans. He treats them throughout both reported dialogue and the long essay that follows as serious Christians, and in his conclusion invites a response from pagans, either directly or through their Christian interlocutors. He certainly seems to think he is replying to a pagan view, not to the opinions actually held by Christians, and in fact both the starting point and the basic parameters of the layman's argument are coherent with contemporary non-Christian thinking. The dialogue starting point was the oracle of the destruction of the Temple of Serapis in Alexandria, newly brought to attention in the late 390s, early 400s by Eunapius of Sardis, who attributed it to the Neoplatonist mystic Antoninus. The layman, in turn, insist on the omnipotence and righteousness of God and assert his concern for religious but not moral affairs. This is badly out of step with any recognizably Christian theology, but maps reasonably well onto the henotheism typical of later pagan piety. It's also worth saying the reason why they run out of time is they are all that they're all about to go into the church service together. So these are these would seem to be fairly serious people. I mean, they, they, they're coming to church. They, they want to know what the answer is. They just don't give in right away. The opening sections of De Divinatione Daimonum thus present something distinctly unusual, a rare attempt by at least moderately literate laymen to represent the kind of things their pagan neighbors might argue in response to articulate Christian opinion makers such as Augustine. Why then did they appeal to the pontifical books? To use a text to judge polytheistic practice might seem a typically Christian maneuver. Think of the proliferation of Varunian citations in, in Augustine's own polemics. But Augustine took the layman's argument as a reflection of pagan respect for the books. Um, I can we can discuss that quotation later on if, if you're interested. Closer investigation reveals that the appeal to the Libri Pontificales can hardly have been inspired by Christian criticism of polytheistic cult. In Augustine's many extant sermons, I've been able to find no references to the Libri of the Pontifices. Might have missed something in that vast haystack, but if so, the needle's pretty small. In the apologetic tradition, Arnobius, and possibly like Tantius, offer a few references, you know, substantive engagement. Augustine says a little more in City of God. In one passage, Seeing this scurrilous misconduct under the legend of Numa's consultation with the nymph Egeria, he credits the sacra which the pontiffs have in their books to Numa's hydromancy. Another, if indeed it is a reference to the Libri and not just to the works of Varro, asks rhetorically whether it would be possible for him to enumerate all the gods that the Romans could hardly describe in big tomes. Even in Augustine's most learned work, therefore, the Libri Pontificales earn only a few brief cameos. The argument is not a reaction, therefore, to something the layman heard from Augustine, or indeed to anything in the Christian literary tradition. I, mean, I recognize it's possible something was in a sermon we don't know about, but if so, it doesn't, it doesn't crop up anywhere else. A peculiar characteristic of De Divinatione Daemonum suggests a specific source of knowledge about the Libri and their importance. From the time he became a clergyman in the early 390s, the writing of City of God, Augustine made only occasional explicit use of his classical learning. 
or so Harald Hagenthal demonstrated. You may have a different view, Catherine. I don't know. We can discuss that later, too. The brief apologetic works from the early 400s are, are one signal exception. In the most elaborate, the first book of On the Harmony of the Evangelists, Augustine cites Virgil, Lucan, Cicero, the Euhemerus of Ennius, Varro, and Porphyry to challenge Roman conceptions of their past and their gods. In letters to pagans or the Christian interlocutors, he alludes to Terence, Juvenal, and Sallust as well. The demonology of De Divinatione Daemonum fits this pattern. Resting on widespread beliefs in demons' longevity, Irish bodies, and so on, it eschews a specifically biblical knowledge from which Augustine, in the work's conclusion, draws numerous prophecies of polytheism's demise. There are basically three parts of the work, the initial um, discussion, the sort of demonological section, and the sort of prophetic portion of it. In the demonological half of the essay, there's only one biblical paraphrase, the story of Jesus calming the storm. Unlike the other apologetic works, however, De Divinatione Daemonum contains only one classical citation. So there is this classical learning there, but there's only one actual reference. The text is from Aeneid 10, where Juno, at least by Augustine's reading, expresses her doubt to Jupiter about the impending death of Turnus. Of Juno, Augustine says only, when he could have cited Cicero's De Natura Deorum as proof, that she is called by them an aerial power. The omission of all but the most elementary of classical citations in a work intended, as Augustine says in its conclusion, to answer pagans who fancied themselves sophisticated, says much about the men for whom he wrote it. They would have been moderately educated, able to read an essay of some complexity, yet uncomfortable with classicizing pyrotechnics. The lone poetic citation also points to another place from which either laymen or pagans could have gotten their knowledge about the Liber Pontificales, Virgil, or rather the grammarian's commentaries that read pontifical lore into the poet's lines. In his study of the pontifical books, Georg Roda enumerated six instances in which the late antique Virgilian commentators, Servius that is, or the so-called Servius Danielis, refer to the Libri Pontificales by that name. The commentators refer in many other places to priestly or sacral lore through circumlocutions, including such expressions as pontifices decunt or verbum pontificale. What the commentators say about the Libri matches the layman's conception. I'll have to admit here, I'm using Tilo and Hagen's edition, so I'm not, I'm not uh, sort of vesting anything in whether it's from Servius or from the mid fourth century material that's added back in. In any case, these are authoritative um, contemporary commentaries. The expanded Servian material says, what holidays are to be celebrated by what kind of people and on what days and the doing of what things is permitted on holidays. If anyone wants to know these things, let him read the pontifical books. In Servius, likewise, we read, there is no substance to the idea advanced by some that Virgil spoke contrary to religious custom when he said that one sacrifices wine to Ceres. After all, the pontifical books do not forbid the practice. All of this is, in a sense, antiquarian lore. Whether or not late antique pontificates ever referred to their predecessors' books, ordinary North African schoolboys grown to adulthood will seldom have found themselves in high priestly offices. Nevertheless, in supplying information to the antiquarians and thus to the grammarians, the Libra Pontificales were more than just historical curiosities. They added the concrete authority of a venerable textual tradition tied through the commentaries to the most respected of classical Latin poets to the received practices that made up proper religio. For present purposes, it therefore matters very little whether these citations do in fact go back to books produced or used by the pontificates in the course of their duties, something John North has, has allowed, or even whether the commentators have conflated such books with other kinds of antiquarian or legal literature, seems likely enough. The accumulation of references to the Roman sacra and priests conveys a message. Not only does a proper understanding of Virgil require and supply a proper understanding of Roman religion, a proper understanding of Roman religion rests on information contained in the Libra Pontificales about traditional practice. That is precisely what we see the layman representing to Augustine around the same time that Servius was teaching such things to schoolboys in Rome. Fittingly, the only one of Augustine's correspondence to offer a defense of the Publica Sacra was Grammaticus, possibly Augustine's own former teacher from Adauros, the hometown of Apuleius. Maximus' brief apologia written probably about 390, Catherine's convinced me of that again, dwells on the excellences of the cults of a little city's forum, which he conflates with the cults of Rome itself. His gods are the Capitoline Triad, Venus and Vesta, against whom the Christian martyrs with barbarous Punic names, such as Nomphamo, are arrayed like the Egyptian monsters against the Roman gods at Actium. I think I've named this letter on the handout, but it's Epistle 16 of Augustine anyway. Like the senator Quintus Aurelius Simicus in the famous Third Relatio, written six years before or so, Maximus finds Virgil a ready source of imagery for his argument. 
Leximachus, too, he upholds the theory, the entire polytheistic religious order throughout the world, tying it to a henotheistic vision of a universe ruled by a supreme deity through manifold lesser powers. Each man, however, focuses his energies on what really inspired his own devotion, Roman religion, whether found in the forum of a North African colonia or in the Curia itself. One of the great questions in the study of what may fairly be called the end of traditional Roman religion, the end that is not of every festival of priesthood, but of regular sacrifices, temple ceremonies, and public funding, is how its adherents adjusted to that change. In Augustine's works, one complaint resounds. By ending traditional cults and embracing the worship of one God in Christ, Christians have destroyed the empire's prosperity. So much for pagan attitudes for Christianity. Of course, that's not, not a new idea. We see it far back. But we do not hear nearly so clearly what pagans thought about the worship that ex had expressed their own devotion. In the layman's arguments, we have one possible reaction. Their case is broadly congruent with the convictions Maximus and Symmachus had expressed some two decades before. What the laymen are defending is polytheistic cult as it used to be done. They start with the Greco-Egyptian cult of Serapis at Alexandria, but the bottom line is a public worship framed in unambiguously Roman terms. The customs of the pontificates, the sacrifices performed according to their books are what really matters. Like Symmachus and Relatio III, the laymen retreat to skepticism in the face of theological questions about the underlying truth of different cults and their relationship to the supreme divinity. When they appeal to the Libra Pontificales, they insist that the judgments of God are inscrutable, and so his reasons for rejecting rights that he had once approved simply cannot be known. That retreat evades Christian insistence on the incompatibility of polytheistic worship with God's singularity. It also leaves open the possibility that God might change his mind. However, the laymen couple those arguments and their appeal to the labor pontificales with the rejection of contemporary clandestine cult. Their criterion is clear enough. The one is governed by the pontiff's books, the other forbidden therein. That they do not acknowledge one's customary household cult or well-known rites conducted in secret, things like the Eleusinian mysteries, is not surprising. They were, after all, sketching an argument off the cuff. An accommodation to Christian disdain and imperial anti-sacrificial legislation the layman's move preserves the august place of the public cult that motivated the apologies for of Maximus and Sinicus many years before, even while it marks a distinct break with their predecessors' arguments. In the 380s, it had still been possible for two great senators, one a learned devotee of the mysteries and theological arcana, the other a public-minded man without apparent interest in such endeavors, to join in service to the priesthoods of the city of Rome. Symmachus may not have shared the mystical piety of his friend Vettius Agorius Praetextatus, but he is nowhere recorded to have de denigrated it. Equally, Praetextatus, patriotic Roman and principled statesman, did not derogate from the cults he and Symmachus shared. Even his wife, who spoke only of those private religious pursuits that she had shared in her eulogistic poem for her now dead husband, this is the longest of the elements in CIL 6, 1779, didn't make it onto your hand, I'm sorry. Even his wife, Paulina, drew no formal distinction between the different kinds of priesthood in which he was engaged, as she did between his priestly and civic offices. All, we may infer, were part of proper religio in the years that would prove, in hindsight, the twilight of Roman civic cult. What happened, however, when the public cult Symmachus and Praetextatus had held in common had ceased, in Africa as in Rome? Men like Praetextatus, Pontifex, Augur, and Quindecumvir might mourn the loss of cults that had upheld the empire, but they still had something vital to fall back on. The pursuit of immortality and mystical experience of the gods had never been an aim of public cult, at least not quay public cult. And it was still open to philosophically minded pagans in Africa when Augustine wrote City of God 8 through 10, years after the debate with the layman. A man like Maximus, however, had revered his town's gods, the gods of Rome and Virgil, and held in distaste the Egyptian gods to which Praetorius and his wife had not failed to offer their worship. Now he had to accept truncation of his own worship to occasional public festivals without sacrifices and furtive offerings in his home, own home or amidst his own fields. To embrace a mystical way of worshiping different from the one in which he had found the raison d'etre of his religion or to insist yet again on the value and importance of the old way of doing things. The layman's friends chose the last approach but held open the possibility that God in his omnipotent justice would restore traditional worship. An interest in Platonist doctrines and in post-mortem salvation was by no means incompatible with devotion to a public cult not long past. Thus, a pagan from Carthage, writing to Augustine almost exactly the same time as his conversation with the layman, appears right next to it in the retractations, his Epistle 102, found an appeal to the antiquity of Roman religio in a passage of what he thought was Porphyry of Tyre, who questioned Christian claims to exclusive salvation in Christ. 
I see Aaron Johnson is in the audience. I'll leave, I'll leave uh, up to others' judgment whether or not it is porphyry, but that's what Isabel Boucher thinks, so may well be anyway. The programmatic distinction Augustine would draw in City of God 1 through 10 between the people who worship the gods for this life and the people who worship them for the next was therefore not absolute. Still, one effect of Christian legislation may have been to show up latent differences among polytheists, differences Augustine's polemics sought to capture. In the remnants of late fourth century pagan writings, we do in fact find some people who seem little concern for the pursuit of immortality and very much for the public cults of the cities. Again, Simicus and Maximus are the types. The pagan friends of the Fratres Laici of De Divinatione Daemonum are of that type. In them, we may find the targets of the first five books of City of God, which aim to prove that the worship of the gods conducted according to all the ancient forms of the pontiffs and the other Roman priesthoods had not in fact achieved anything for Rome and the Romans. And then we may also see how educated men of the early fifth century, conscious of the weight of Roman tradition, could try to maintain the memory of the public cults and to hold open the possibility of the restoration in a world that had, as it seemed, capriciously rejected them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthias. That absolutely fascinating um and i think this fundamental question of how adherence adjusted to this change um that is is so important and so exciting and you've gestured to all sorts of ways to consider that um questions i've asked our assistant um that you should be able to answer to ask directly in your own voices if you would prefer to put it in a question in the chat please do <coughs> one thing one thing i want to ask you matthias i mean as as we both know, as many of us here know, it's incredibly hard once you start using Augustinian material to think it, think in other frameworks um, because he's so dominating. Um, you're, you are making the most admirable attempt to do that. What I'm Thinking of what I was thinking of is that you were speaking was Duncan McRae's work on um, civic religion in the well in the mid to late empire. Um, I'm wondering if you're familiar with that. I mean, what what seems to be transformative about it is precisely the the notion that it's not just about practice; it's almost about, it's also about books, and you're you're very much gesturing towards that, I would say, in, in this part of your work. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the issue there is the, the question of the sort of tralitician quality of the commentaries. So, mm. you know, we have some, Aelius Donatus, I believe, is faulted for sort of copying from people before him, and Servius is clearly copying from people before him too. And then the possibly Donatus' material that gets shoved back into Servius later on. Um, so the question is not simply, do we have theologians, to use that in McRae's somewhat loose sense of the word, who are writing about cult, um, people like Nagidius Figulus or Varro, the greatest. What, do, what does it mean when that sort of thing enters, well, the textbook tradition? And everybody knows a little bit about it, but you don't actually consult the original. I'm not certain Alan Cameron's right that only Augustine of the, the early fifth century readers of Varro is actually reading Varro, but the case can be made. And the fact that the case can be made shows that at the least people are not reading him very creatively, very intelligently, which uh, Augustine to some degree shows off that he's doing. Um, so I think, I think what I would say is McRae's approach is very interesting. It's perhaps a rather different issue here, but it's well worth observing that yes, books have mattered before Christians really sort of explode onto the scene. Um, also worth saying, you know, I, I fall pretty firmly on the side of those people who think that there is a meaningful category of belief in Roman religion. 
not not faith in the sense of a sort of doctrinal body of doctrine or or um let alone an idea that you must trust in god for some salvation or something like that but simply the idea that there are things people actually think about the gods and that that matters to some degree and certainly matters in the fourth century into the fifth um but yes this is this is perhaps a somewhat different situation um the, the bigger question is what were people making of things like Varro? And I, I don't know, possibly not much more than reading it in the commentaries, knowing it matters. And then Augustine can come along and say, well, look, this is the authoritative book about your old religion. This doesn't make sense. Um, which I think is much of the point of City of God. I mean, I take, I take the point of the first 10 books of City of God in a nutshell to be to prove that none of the gods can grant that which people should expect, uh, should be trying to seek from God in their religious practices, um, you know, and going through that systematically. Weirdly enough, using Varro to argue that none of the public gods could bring people eternal salvation. Which I'm not sure any of his known interlocutors actually believed. Uh, someone like Materius of Kalama is maybe the closest we get, but he's, he's not too concerned about the gods. He's quite pagan in a way, but not, not, not too much about that. Mm. Other questions? I don't mean my answer to dominate the whole time. No, no, it's extremely illuminating. Well, it's not, I, feel, I feel Matthias and I can, can chat away indefinitely, but perhaps we, we ought to move on um, to our next speaker. Matthias, thank you so much. Um, and I will be in touch. We will we will chat further. Um, so our, our, and in the pause, momentary pause between papers, let me once again invite members of the audience to turn on their cameras if they would um, care to, just so that there's a sense of a gathering of a of a crowd for our speakers. Thank you. And our second speaker is. Michelle Saltzman, very early in the morning. Um, Michelle's at UC Riverside, as most of you will know. She is going to speak to us under the title, The Acts of Sylvester, History, Legend, and Sundays in Rome. Thank you. Thank you, um, Catherine. I'm going to um, share my screen. Uh, I think I'm going to share my screen. Uh, there she go there. And um, welcome everybody. It's early for me. I know it's later for you. And let's see. Okay. Good morning. Okay. Um, strange, I cannot see you now, but um, let's begin. So I'm talking about the acts of Sylvester. When the Emperor Constantine stipulated in 321 for the first time in the history of the Roman Empire, that the day of the sun, that is in his law, dies solis, be a day of rest and the law courts closed, he seems to have had the city of Rome directly in mind. Indeed, its revolutionary law in the Justinian, preserved the Justinian Code, was directed to Helpidius, the vicar of Icarius, of the city of Rome at the time. But the impetus for this law likely arose from this emperor's interactions with the bishops who were in dialogue with Constantine since 306, many of whom we actually know by name. Missing from this list, however, is Sylvester, the Bishop of Rome at the time. Um, let's see if I could, be, yeah, good, I could at least see Catherine, um, good. Um, Bishop uh, from 31 of January 314 through December of 335. And he would presumably be directly affected by this Sunday law. If Sylvester met the Semper when he was in Rome, either in 315 or 326, no fourth century source mentions it or details Sylvester's relationship with Constantine. We do, however, have a later fifth century account, the Acts of Sylvester, to Silvestri that give this bishop a key role in the life of Constantine and in defining proper observances on Sundays. But scholars have focused on the acts of Sylvester primarily to discuss Constantine's miraculous conversion by Sylvester in 
data to 324 in the Acts, as shown here in this, I couldn't resist it, this 13th century fresco from the Church of Santi Coronati in Rome. Because of this focus, they have overlooked what the Acts of Sylvester can tell us about popular understanding of the meaning of Sunday ritual practices on this day and through the seven day week. More importantly, the ex, um, scholars overlook how bishops use the control of these practices in the late fifth and sixth century to secure their authority in Rome over other Christian groups, especially. So as I argue in this paper, the ex of Sylvester, an admittedly fictional text can tell us nevertheless what late fifth, early sixth century Romans thought was the correct interpretation and ritual practice of Sunday and the seven day week. Disputations over liturgical practice like fasting and vigils in the text also demonstrate more generally how papal authority was grounded in efficacious ritual knowledge and a pastoral ascetic discourse that the bishop used to control divergent Christian groups in the city. No wonder then that what was alleged as Sylvester's ideas about Sunday practice lived on to influence later writers who cared far less about Constantine's actual legal pronouncements and far more about the role of the bishops. At the same time, the transference to Sylvester of fifth and sixth century ideas about Sunday practice that I will associate in large part with Pope Leo who was Pope in the middle of the fifth century from 440 to 461 this transfers can help us to better appreciate innovations in liturgical Sunday practice, which, as I said, I will uh, associate um, uh, with, uh, with Leo uh, to some degree um, but at the, in the conclusion to this paper. But I want to begin with the evidence from the Acts of Sylvester. As I noted, we have no secure fourth century evidence for the relationship between emperor and bishop. Nonetheless, stories about that relationship certainly circulated widely. Scholars cannot determine the date, place, or origin of most of those stories, although several have argued that the idea that the emperor was baptized in Rome by its bishop originated in, not in Rome, but in the East, likely as a response to critical claims that Constantine had been baptized on his deathbed by an Arian bishop. There is, however, a scholarly consensus that by the second half of the fifth century, these stories that were circulating in Rome, at least, as independent narratives of the belly, were collected and edited and, have, uh, and edited. They have come down to us in three different versions. My paper focuses largely on the earliest version, version A, um, which was written in Latin and is dated to the late fifth century, although I follow Canella, who has shown that it was likely altered in the mid of sixth century. The two other versions, one in Greek in the early sixth and a composite version C, B, and C, a composite version in the eighth and ninth centuries, I'm not going to be looking at. These, the Acts of Sylvester, however, were widely read, which is why we have close to over 350 manuscripts. So to be clear, just to restate, my interest in the Acts is not as a strictly historically accurate depiction of the fourth century relationship with Sylvester and Constantine, but because it conveys assumptions of this relationship that were shaped by the late fifth, early sixth century, specifically Roman understanding of the norms of Christian worship in Rome. Indeed, Sylvester's knowledge of liturgy and ritual function through the acts as uh, Christina Tessa has observed, as and I quote, both a primary thematic component of the acts in a major facet of his authority, end quote. There are several different stories in the Acts uh, that demonstrate this theme. But uh, uh, I'm going to begin with the account that precedes the far more famous uh, baptism, uh, which is a far less famous uh, debate between Sylvester and an Eastern bishop named Euphrosinus, um, who asked, before Sinus said that he had been commanded in a dream to come to the Church of the Apostles with his Eastern bishops. According to the Acts, he was a facile teacher, familiar with both Greek and Latin, and his appearance was equally pleasing. And that may explain his name. Perhaps its name is after the Greek word for merriment, Euphrosyne, 
Well, we do. There was no such named person that we know of, Euphrosinus, in Rome. In any case, Euphrosinus had attained a following. And he came in, into Rome. Uh, he had argued in Rome that only one Saturday per year should be celebrated with a fast. That is the one before Easter. Because only on that one Saturday was Christ buried before his resurrection on Easter Sunday. Moreover, for that reason, that Saturday was far more holy than the fifth day of the week, that is Thursday Ascension. So there should be no celebration of fasting on any Thursday. Um, and so it was up to um, Leo, um, excuse me, it's up to um, Sylvester to respond. And I will just read the English. I, you have the Latin there in purple. You're so inclined. Um, Sylvester argued um, in two major movements. Uh, in this first, he said, if you wish to celebrate one Saturday with a fast, therefore celebrate one Sunday. But if every Sunday is believed to be the day of resurrection, honored with glory, every Saturday that precedes it ought to be kept as a day of his burial with a fast, so that he may deservedly rejoice in his resurrection, who had mourned about his death. Sylvester then went on to explain as well that the fifth day, Thursday, was the beginning of the celebration when, and I'll just translate, the ascension of the Lord was revealed to the prophets. Sylvester then went on to list all the positive things that should take place on Thursday, including emperors giving indulgences to criminals and masters indulging their bad slaves. Sylvester emphasizes the joys of the day of Thursday, as so they would be on Sunday. Fasting is not an appropriate response on either day. The author of the Acts does not detail all of Sylvester's arguments. He says it would take way too long to do so. But he concludes by um, emphasizing the victory of Sylvester over the Eastern bishops. By teaching about these and similar things, Sylvester quieted uh, every counter argument that the most Christian Greeks and learned men who were speaking were remembered to have put forth in opposition. This apostolic seat truly taught from Peter on things which cannot be overcome by any sort of reason. Um, Sylvester's refutation of fasting on Thursdays and Sundays followed what his predecessor, Pope Miltiades, had also allegedly opposed. In the nearly contemporary sixth century book of the popes, the Liber Pontificalis, Miltiades, who was um, Bishop of Rome between 310 and 314, Miltiades had stipulated against fasting on Thursday or Sunday, for that matter, in order, as Miltiades said in the book of the popes, to distinguish Christians from pagans. Should be noted that Socrates also, in his ecclesiastical history, argued against Sunday fasting. By the late fifth century, however, as the Acts of Sylvester suggest, the Pope was debating about these issues not with pagans, but with other Christians. In this case, Eastern Christians, um, who uh, uh, a different sort of threat to the papacy in the late fifth century, as I shall come back to later. Sylvester is represented as asserting the joyous Sunday to celebrate the Lord's resurrection, and so the proper day for a host of liturgical actions to be described um, below, that he describes uh, in the text. Um, of course, there is no evidence that this debate took place with Eastern bishops, um, nor, uh, that, for that matter, is any evidence that Sylvester ever taught Constantine everything. Um, yet, that is the basis for the relationship in the more famous narrative story, which comes directly after this defeat of Eastern bishops about Sunday. Um, and so, uh, what I want to emphasize when I turn to the more famous narrative of Constantine's conversion, uh, again, is what has not been noticed by scholars is how the story of the emperor's conversion and baptism is also tied to Sunday and revolves around the seven day week in ways that contemporary popes, notably Leo, would also have emphasized. And so we're going to turn to the more famous story of his conversion um, 
according to the acts and as represented here in yet another fresco from Santi Coronati, um, the emperor was very sick. He had leprosy. Um, and uh, this was a form of punishment because of his persecution of Christians. Constantine initially had asked pagan priests to find a means to heal him. Um, turning even to the pontifices Capitolii, pontiffs of the Capitolium, nothing that I'm aware that actually existed. The pagan priests recommended a really terrible cure. Constantine had bathed on the Capitolium in a pool filled with the blood of young boys. The emperor, to his credit, turned away from this horrific act, but still he was not cured. So he went to sleep in the palace and where in a dream, the apostles Peter and Paul is shown here, come to him and, um, and tell him and praised him for doing the right thing, that is not killing the young boys. They also directed him to Pope Sylvester. The accent goes on to narrate how Sylvester taught Constantine um, after confirming Constantine's belief in Christ as the son of God, Sylvester laid his hands on the emperor and made him a catechumen. Sylvester then directed the emperor to implement a whole week of penitence, including among other things, weekly almsgiving, Sunday almsgiving. The Pope then led the clerics in a two day fast, Friday and Saturday. On Saturday at evening prayer, Sylvester, his clerics, and the emperor entered the baths of the Lateran Palace. Sylvester led the prayers and then at some undisclosed moment, immersed the emperor in the waters for his baptism. And this is early morning of Sunday. So that the rebirth of baptism is associated with the new light of Sunday, a conjunction that harkens back to the second century apology of Justin Martyr. In the text of the Acts, what follows immersion is a bright light and a very loud noise, uh, as a noise of a new beginning, a new day. Indeed, we're told that the emperor, now healed and spiritually rejuvenated, spent the following seven day a week taking actions on behalf of his new faith, including donating monies for churches on Saturdays and then going in procession for confession to the apostle Peter that Sylvester on the following Sunday. So everything that Constantine does is orchestrated around the seven day week, baptism on Sunday and the following Sunday after a week of um, an almsgiving culminates on the next Sunday with confession. So this uh, time frame, the timing of the baptism and the orchestration of the rites that precede it and follow it, uh, quite literally reflect um, the dawn of a new life for the emperor with the opening of the Lord's Week on Sunday. They also reflect the kinds of concerns that we hear from other late Roman aristocrats from the late fifth and early sixth century. So for example, we know from a letter that the Roman deacon John wrote to a sixth century senator named Cenarius that Roman aristocrats were deeply concerned about the meaning of baptism. That letter has a whole series of questions and answers about it. Constantine's conversion revolved around the liturgical rhythms of his seven day week, as I noted. Although, as Cesar uh, um, in her 2016 article rightly observed, the acts are, quote, not a perfect snapshot of contemporary practices of baptism in Rome, yet they convey vividly uh, the experience of baptism and the kinds of meanings associated with it. What I would argue is that they also vividly convey the experience of a week of, of practices in Rome and the emotions with it. Sylvester's role as an authority on liturgy and Sundays in particular, as depicted in the Acts, influenced later writers, so much so that the learned monk Bede in the eighth century asserted that it was Sylvester himself who on his own authority made the seven day week begin with the Dies Dominica. Of course, we cannot accept Bede's assertion that, and I'm translating, Pope Sylvester called the first day of the week on which the light was made in the beginning and Christ's resurrection is and celebrated the Lord's day. But we can understand how texts like the Acts of Sylvester, which made this Pope the authoritative source for the implementation of Sunday liturgy and the seven day week came to be promulgated in the late fifth and sixth century city 
and influence leading writers. Moreover, the acts reflect attitudes about the authority of the Bishop of Rome, which in particular also show the influence of one particular fifth century Pope, Leo. And it's to Leo that I'd like to turn by way of conclusion to this paper. Just briefly, we, Leo was a very active Pope between 440 and 460, um, and he's left us uh, a slew of letters and sermons. In three extant letters to clergy in Thessalonica, Alexandria, and Gaul, Leo tried to establish that all not just bishops, but all clergy celebrate their ordination on Sundays, a habit which seems to have been the case in Rome. He wanted this to happen in all across the, the Mediterranean in seas connected to him or over which he had any kind of authority. And more than that, as Uta Heil has argued, Leo does so by leading to the specific salvific quality of Sunday, the day chosen by God himself for his specific gifts. By doing, do, by doing this, Heil argues, Leo has given Sunday a kind of um, a relatively new significance. And we can hear something of that in, uh, in his letters. Uh, and again, um, I've given you the English and the Latin. Um, I'll just read the English. Um, this is a letter that he wrote, letter nine, to the Bishop of Alexandria, Dioscus. Um, and I hope, uh, I'll read you the English, that therefore you will piously and laudably follow apostolic precedence if you yourself also maintain, maintain this form of ordaining priests throughout the churches over which the Lord has called you to, to preside. That those who are to be consecrated should never receive the blessing except on the day of the Lord's resurrection, which is commonly held to begin on the evening of Saturday and which has been so often hallowed with the mysterious dispensation of God that all the more notable institutions of the Lord were accomplished on that day. Oh. Leo's letter recognizes that fasting on, well, he also mentions that fasting on Saturday was the custom in Alexandria, as was also attested by the Eastern bishops whom Sylvester debated. But as Uta Heil uh, demonstrates by discussing these blessings and he uses the term Benedict, Benedicta, um, that God gave on this day, and he actually goes on to relate them in, at great length, Leo makes Sunday into a special divine day in a relatively new way. Although in the second century, Justin Martyr had connected the creation of the world and the resurrection of Christ with Sunday as the first day of the week. And in the third century, Arjun had said that the distribution of mana happened on Sunday. <laughs> the only other text before Leo that lists the various Sunday benedictions is the late fourth century anonymous Ambrosiaster, which can be dated to three, between 366 and 384. So, Heil focuses on the new meanings attached to Sunday by Pope Leo. But I want here to emphasize that Leo's intent was to use liturgy to assert his authority across the Mediterranean and to spread his understanding of Sunday as the only day for the ordination of the clergy. How innovative this was may not be readily apparent. And it's worth mentioning, as I will, that in mid fifth century Rome, many of the elements that we today as modern observers of Sunday assume as normative did not take place, i.e. we, as far as we know, there was not regular church attendance. There were not regular sermons, not even regular almsgiving. So this appreciation of what little was yet standard Sunday practice helps to explain why Leo's ideas were so novel in many ways. But Leo's, and Leo's authority gave Sunday this added association, which seems to have remained, at least if that is, is what the evidence from the letters of the late fifth century Pope Gelasius would indicate. Because Gelasius also, who was Pope at the very end of the fifth century, also supports the notion that Sundays beginning on Saturday evening um, uh, fasting, uh, celebration should be the proper time to ordain priests and bishops and he uses similar reasoning. Leo's innovations about Sunday may be reflected also in the Acts, but this was a text 
Uh, for indeed, the Acts was a text that spoke to the concerns of late 5th and 6th century Romans in particular. Certainly the victory of the Roman Pope Sylvester over the Eastern learned bishops would appeal especially well after tensions between the East and West emerged. After 484, the bishops of Rome split from the Patriarch of Constantinople in what was the first schism between East and West, the so-called Acacian schism. I'm not going to the theology, but I suffice it to say that contestations over papal authority fueled much of the theological dis disputation, as I've also argued in my 2019 Journal of Early Christian Studies article. In the early sixth century, after the Acacian schism was resolved by 519, the desire for the papacy to assert its authority in new ways through the legendary construction of Sylvester became even more, um, uh, well, more desirable. As they, as Romans, were now living first under an Arian king, Theodoric, and then in the sixth century under an Eastern emperor, Justinian, who used his powers to dominate the papacy in new and even violent ways. No wonder then that the legends of Sylvester and Constantine appealed to the sensibilities of Roman audiences of the late fifth and sixth centuries, who may well have listened to it on Sundays in Rome. Thank you. Now I'm going to end this, I think. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank uh, you. I think here we all pause to congratulate the SCS program committee for its extremely <laughs> astute programming of this talk on a Sunday morning um, <laughs> before we all go off for our week of arms giving there is a few minutes of course for for questions thank you Oops. so again questions oh, no. Hi. Okay. Hi. Michelle, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so uh, you quoted a passage about the most learned Greeks, or excuse me, about the most Christian, the Greiki Christianissimi. Um, mm -hmm. And then you closed your talk referring to the schism, um, East-West schism. Um, and I, so I'm just curious if you could elaborate a bit more on, it. are there more details in the Acts of Sylvester that might indicate uh, a sort of rivalry or tension um, with the Greeks in particular. Um, and then what do you make if, I, I'm really hazy on this because I don't work on this material at all, but isn't the Acts of Sylvester attributed to Eusebius? It's, it's claimed to be a translation from the Greek or maybe my wires are crossed and I'm misremembering, but isn't it claimed to be a translation from Eusebius? Of course, I don't think anybody believes that, but <laughs> Set, setting itself up as that sort of a text. Anyway, could you maybe comment on, on that? Sure, uh, yeah, thank you for the questions, Erin, it's nice to see you. Um, uh, there, there is that, but again, there are those different versions that um, the version B, which was translated into Greek in the early sixth century is the one that's usually associated with Eusebius. So to answer your second question first. So, um, so that's where that idea comes from. The Latin version um, uh, obviously is, there is that idea, but it must, it's grew up much later because they're thinking Eusebius and someone is thinking, but there is a Greek version and that's where you see that attribution to Eusebius. Nobody believes it, of course, but it makes sense. Sylvester, Eusebius known, so we could see how it happened. Um, but the version that I was working on, the earlier version, doesn't have that attestation. Um, there, there is uh, this passage about Sedes, there is at the, the very end of Acts ends with a contestation or a dispute <laughs> between Constantine and, and Jewish um, rabbis. Um, and uh, of course, Constantine uh, wins that um, uh, and this letter of Helena. So there isn't that much other, uh, there aren't many other references to Greeks in the text uh, that way. So this, this section, which um, takes up oh, about 
four pages uh, and it is the primary er area in which you see this conflict between uh, over the Greeks, or this representation of Greeks. Um, and it references, I, I went through it quickly, I know, but it references Greeks and um, learned men, uh, calling them most learned men. So I think that's part of the, the difference. But there is a full uh, four or five printed pages where he talks about these, this group in Rome and sees them as a kind of, um, you know, contesting. Um, uh, uh, Greci Christianissimi et docti muri. So, so he combines them and he talks about Euphrosinus's um, followers uh, and why they follow him. Um, so that's why his name is, is suspicious to me. So, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank Noel? you. And Noel has his hand up. Yes, thank you, Michelle, for that wonderful talk. And um, my question is, um, Maybe ancillary to your talk, but it's something that bothers me, and that is the um, the question of the fact that, uh, as you mentioned when you talked about the Constantinian law, it references the dies solis, and then um, your Sylvester passages are talking about um, the dies dominica, um, and the the Constantinian law has been taken by some to indicate that this is not really about Christianity at all; that this is more of Constantine's sun worship, um, and. Uh, we could go on and on about the question of how the days of the week are named and so forth, but I'm just wondering if you might speak to the way that um, that factors into the maybe shifts over time and attitudes about um, the, the significance of this day, uh, but also if it represents any kind of a commentary on Constantine himself, or is it simply just a, a shift in linguistic usage? Great question. No, like we can talk about this at great length, <laughs> but um, uh, I, you know, I, I began this paper. Actually, I began working on this because I was just interested in Sunday. And what's really striking about Constantine's law, of course, is that he doesn't use the Christian terminology, nor does he say what you should do on Sunday. It's simply it's a day off, right? Um, and then Eusebius, he has the image on. He Eusebius does emphasize everything that Christian does. It can be interpreted as Christian. And he does mention that he allows um, soldiers to worship on Sundays, but you know, but none of the other kind of liturgical issues. Um, I do think it, it's um, the acts are very much using a, a turn a turn in terminology that reflects a later fifth century development, and the, it is a comment on. <coughs> um, you know, Constantine is um, a great sinner. And this is really a reflection of that. <laughs> he needs to be saved. So he needs to find the faith as it were. Um, it's, it's something that the bishops have to work out over time. I think Constantine intentionally chose language that could be interpreted either way because he was interested in you know, appealing to a wider range. <laughs> That's what I think. But I do think this is a comment on his um, need to be taught by the bishop. And what, one of the things he's learning about is the meaning of the days of the week, you know, and the, that Dies Dominicus, which is why <coughs> the, um, why the account with the Greeks um, and the teaching about uh, the proper fasting precedes his conversion. I think that's an intentional um, connection. It's an intentional comment in, in the text that others don't seem to have cared about or noticed. And uh, Matthias, last, last question. Thanks. More of a comment than a question, actually. It strikes me that your thing with the, your, your, your sort of story of the, the uh, Pontificates Capitolii and the sort of Bluebeard thing with the bathing in the blood, blood of the boys and all of that strikes me as similar to the story in the Book of the Promises and Predictions of God, often attributed to Quadvolt Deus of Carthage during his exile, certainly by some kind of exiled North African clergyman who had been a young a sort of um, clergyman during, during uh, the reign of Aurelius in the, in the early 420s. Um, he has valuable knowledge about North African paganism and so on. But on the other hand, he can claim that up until the time of Stilicho, uh, virgins were being sacrificed to a mechanical dragon in a cave in Rome. Um, and I, I do wonder how much of this just sort of legend making, I mean, maybe somebody was doing that. 
I'm trying to imagine Simicus here setting up the uh, the mechanical dragon to entrap some some you know reject Vestal Virgin or something, something like this. I mean, it's absurd when we're on its face. Um, I wonder well, how that kind of legend making you know it's, it's happening for the pagans too as well as the Christians or happening among the Christians about the pagans. And one thinks then of Gal the famous sort of Lupercalia during Galatius's reign with this kind of reenactment and, and that sort of thing. I, I just, I wonder how much they really knew about any of this. Like I said, a comment as opposed to a question. Um, you know, though I know you're, you're interested in Roman civic cult as well, you know, the fourth century and all. Uh, it's there. I, I, you know, I, I don't know. Don't know if it boils down to a question, but. Well, you know, but, but I think what we're getting at, I mean, what attracts me to this text, and, it, and there is in the end, there is a dragon also that Sylvester manages to defeat and, and, and liberate Rome from, you know, in, as well right. in the acts. So th I think we're getting a sort of common sort of narrative motifs that cut across obviously pagan and Christian ideas about how you, what kind of authority you have, what kind of power your leaders have. That's, Steve, that's, yeah, go on, sorry. No, I, I just I just think it's, um, you know, what's interesting to me about the Acts is that it's not a learned text. It's not Simicus. Right, Simicus right. would probably say, poo poo, you know, this is what, uh, you know, not so learned people think. And I kind of I find it appealing that this, I mean, even the, the Latin is quite simple. It's not, it's not the kind of polished, it's not literary, it's not the literary prose in the way that, you know, so we, the, the whole text is a different order of, um, uh, of audience, different audience, yeah. And the relics of Stephen, I think, defeat a dragon too in North Africa in um, the sort of, oh, the collection written for Ravodius, it might be the collection written for Ravodius of Azalis, but it might be a different, different body material. I have to double check that it's a serpent or a dragon or something, something like that. And remember that the, the dragon is also Constantinian, that, that um, Constantine uh, supposedly puts this image of himself defeating Licinius depicted as a dragon above the entryway to the palace in Constantinople, and it also shows up on his face ray public icon. So it's, uh, oh. it goes way back. There's been an interesting new um, inscription that was uh, found in... Um, now I'm trying to remember where in Turkey, but it's uh, probably fifth century and it shows a soldier um, who is um, stabbing a dragon. Uh, so, uh, but, but not in the manner of St. George, he's not mounted. Um, he, he is a uh, um, sort of standing soldier and so forth. And uh, I'll, I'll see if I can find that image and then I could share it with us. Um, it's uh, something mm -hmm. that should be published soon. Oh, that'd be wonderful. Um... But you know, so so you know, it's it's kind of, it's not something that you usually think of um, being antique. <laughs> you know, and some you know, we're moving into you know sort of a very different kind of realm of sort of iconography. Then I, mean, I wonder how. Um, I think the dragon is so connected with medieval thinking. And it's just kind of interesting that, that that would be something that shows up with Constantine. That begins with Constantine. I'd love to see that. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank thank you all so much. Um, I'm sorry to shut this down, but it's time to move from dragons to virgins. Um, <laughs> and with the paper of Anisia Metrakos of UC Berkeley, um, her paper is entitled Sophrosyne as a Virtue of Ascetic Women in Late Antiquity. Anisia. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen now. All right. I want to open this presentation with a quote from Euripides' Trojan Women. Where Andromache describes how she fulfilled the role of an ideal wife to her husband, Hector. Everything that women have discovered of modest behavior, I practice diligently in the house of Hector. First, whether or not there is anything blameworthy in a woman's conduct, the very fact that she goes out of the house draws criticism. I let go of all longing for this and I stayed in the house. I did not admit within my walls women with their clever talk, but was content to have within myself a good teacher, my own mind. I kept my tongue quiet and my gaze tranquil before my husband. I knew where I ought to be the winner over my husband and where I should yield the victory to him. 
From the archaic period onwards, Greek literature defined feminine virtue as staying cloistered within the home, speaking little and not causing grief to one's husband. Virtue is epitomized by the Homeric Penelope and the Andromache. By the fifth century BC, the word sophrosyne was used to define a wide range of virtues and ideal behaviors of Greek women, including modesty, chastity, temperance, soundness of mind, devotion to one's husband and children, and care for the home. For over a millennium, Sophrosini was upheld as the foremost virtus feminarum of the Greco-Roman world, which personified the ideal wife and defined expectations for model feminine behavior. While the definition of Sophrosini as a virtue of men changed over time, taking on different shades of meaning from Homer to the church fathers, feminine Sophrosini remained remarkably consistent as evidenced by a wealth of inscriptions and texts praising good women throughout Greek literature. In the fourth and early fifth centuries AD, the same cultural expectations and meanings associated with feminine sophrosyne and antiquity were still being maintained in epitaphs, encomia, letters, and sermons. When the fourth century theologian Gregory of Nazianzus praised his sister Gorgonia as a woman of incomparable sophrosyne he drew on the standard set of feminine virtues. Borgonia possessed the modesty, temperance, devotion to husband and home that defined the ideal wife in antiquity. Like Euripides Andromache, Borgonia's virtues and her person were anchored within the home. As a Christian, however, Borgonia's concern and care for her family extended to securing their salvation as well as her own. As Gregory shifted his focus from Gorgonia's domestic virtues to her asceticism, he showed how her sophrosyne was a unique blend of traditional feminine virtues and Christian piety. As the first Christian hagiographical text in praise of a woman, Gregory's oration crafted a model of the pious Christian matron by marrying the Greco-Roman virtue of sophrosyne with Christian asceticism. In late antique hagiography, Sofrosini remained the principal virtue for married Christian women. However, this term took on new meaning. By the early fifth century, an increased emphasis on chastity shifted the hierarchy of virtues for Christian women. As Kyle Harper has shown, continence was often regarded as the primary path to salvation, even for the married. And by the mid fifth century, Sofrosini largely took on the meaning of this complete chastity in ascetic discourse. In the hagiographies of the mid fifth and sixth centuries, Sofrosini became a descriptor of ascetic matrons who rejected the traditional role of the wife, mother, and housekeeper, preferring instead to make lives for themselves outside of the house and apart from their husbands and children. These ascetic women, endowed by their hagiographers with Sofrosini, such as the well-known Roman noblewoman, Melania the Younger, or the Constantinopolitan abbess, Matrona of Pergi, were visible and vocal in late Roman society and known rejectors of their previous lives as aristocratic matrons. Nevertheless, aspects of Gorgonia's model of Sofrosini can still be found in their hagiographies. This paper examines the ways in which notions of feminine Sofrosini were upheld and reimagined by late antique hagiographers in their narratives on elite ascetic matrons. The first part of the paper explores Gorgonia's embodiment of the Greco-Roman ideal of feminine Sofrosini in the fourth century AD, while the second part narrows in on two examples of Sofrosini in the fifth and sixth century hagiographies of Melania the Younger and Matrona of Pergi. Their virtues closely mirror Gorgonia's except in one major aspect. These women chose not to remain at home and serve their families. Their sophrosyne rather reflects their desire to put off their husbands and live in chastity. For these ascetic matrons, sophrosyne was a powerful descriptor that referred Here's what to I their found. desired state of continence, while also hearkening back to traditional Greco-Roman models of feminine virtue. Gregory of Nazianzus's funeral oration for his sister Gorgonia lists the ideal qualities of a married Christian woman. Drawing on traditional feminine virtues hearkening back to Homer, Gregory weaves together the Greco-Roman ideal of the dutiful wife, mother, and housekeeper with Christian asceticism to create a new model of the feminine, vir a feminine virtue in the fig figure of Gorgonia as a noble matron, mother, and ascetic. Gregory singles out Gorgonia's pinnacle virtue as sophrosyne, the modesty, self-control, chastity, and soundness of mind that I defined the ideal wife in antiquity. 
the meaning of sophrosynia extended to all aspects of a woman's comportment, from her manner of speech, or rather her silence, to her gait, clothing, adornment, even her hairstyle, and most importantly, her devotion to her husband, children, and home. In the words of Kyle Harper, Sofrosini and its Latin equivalent, Pudicitia, quote, implied both an objective fact and a subjective mode of being. It was a state of body and a state of mind, end quote. To seem chaste was as essential as being chaste itself. The truly Sophron wife blushed, when modest, blushed with modesty when addressed, was rarely seen outside the home and even more rarely heard. As Gregory eulogizes, Borgonia was the ideal wife in all of these respects. Discussing Solomon's Proverbs, praising the good and loving housewife, Gregory contrasts Gorgonio's activity as a woman engaged honorably at home and who loves her husband with the woman who wanders abroad, who is uncontrolled and dishonorable. Like Solomon's good wife, Gorgonia performs her duties with a manly courage, her hands constantly at the spindle as she prepares double cloaks for her husband. Gorgonia's sofrosini is heightened by her seclusion and uncommon modesty. But while her modesty is praiseworthy, her seclusion is almost lamentable to Gregory. He says, who was ever more worthy to be seen, yet was seen less and kept herself more inaccessible to the eyes of men. To help divert unwanted gazes, Gorgonia dressed herself with great simplicity, shunning the latest fashions and hairstyle and never adorned herself with jewelry or cosmetics. From antiquity, an excessive interest in fashion and adornment, and the use of cosmetics in particular, was seen by moralists as a rejection of the traditional feminine role. Women obsessed with dress had no time for household and husband. The use of makeup was particularly reproachable for it advertised a deceitful character brimming with potential unchastity. As Kelly Olson summarizes, quote, dress and beauty were an index of the mind and the character of the wearer, the speech of the body, end quote. Gorgonia's simple appearance advertised her virtue to her viewer, making what Virginia Burris would refer to as a spectacle of her very modesty. But the best evidence for her sophrosini, Gregory argues, is found in her role as the spiritual guide of her family, who converted her husband to Christianity and secured the salvation of her family. Gregory opens his praise of, praises of Gorgonia by describing her incomparable sophrosini and the surprising results of her perfection of his virtue. Gorgonia Sofrosini surpassed all the women of her own day, not to mention those of old who were greatly famed for modesty, to such a degree that she herself avoided the spiritual disadvantages of marriage and united the loftiness of celibacy with the security of marriage. Gorgonia Sofrosini allowed her to blend the virtues of marriage and celibacy without any disadvantages, putting her in a realm otherwise unaccounted for between both states of existence. She was able to do this, Gregory assures, because she was modest without being proud, showing that neither of these things binds us completely to or separates us from God or the world. Gregory next illustrates how Gorgonia's devotion to husband and family did not interfere with her devotion to God, but rather allowed her to serve one by serving the other. Although she was tied according to the flesh, she was not on that account separated from the spirit nor because she had her husband as her head did she ignore her first head. When she had served the world and nature a little, to the extent that the law of the flesh willed it, or rather, he who imposed this law on the flesh, she consecrated herself wholly to God. Gorgonia's service to her husband is reflected as a service imposed by God. After the service has been rendered, and children were born and raised, she was rewarded and able to consecrate herself wholly to God and live in continence. She was successful in this endeavor because she had first convinced her husband of her views, just as she had encouraged his prior conversion to Christianity. This crowning achievement, referred to by Gregory as her most beautiful and noble action, is heightened by the beautiful fruit of her union, dedicating to God her whole family and household instead of her single soul. Gorgonia is presented as the spiritual guide of her husband and children and the perfect mother, an exemplar of every excellence to her children. However, despite her sofrosini stemming from her role as a model wife and mother, Gregory says very little about Gorgonia's unnamed husband and children. They are the means of her sofrosini, 
that Gregory recognizes Gorgonio's true desire as Christ. After ensuring her family's salvation, Gorgonia devotes herself entirely to Christian asceticism and following illness and baptism, she consecrates her body to God and lives in continence with her husband until her death. As Virginia Burress suggests, Gorgonia's baptism and continence restore her virginity anew. Thus her deathbed scene is one in anticipation of marriage as she prepares to meet her new bridegroom, Christ. In Gregory's oration, feminine sofrosini begins to carry a double meaning of matronly virtue and bodily chastity, creating a paradoxical portrait of a married woman and mother of children who becomes a continent bride of Christ while her husband and children are still living. This pattern of an elite matron churned to chaste ascetic is partially mirrored in later vitae, including the life of Melania the Younger and the life of Matrona of Pergi, though with major a major difference. Gorgonia's sanctity was crafted within her home, serving her family as a pious wife and mother. For Melania and Matrona, their holiness was established by abandoning these roles. While their hagiographies endow them with Sofrosini, this term reflects their desire to put off their husbands and live in chastity. When Melania the Younger is described early on in the prologue of her Greek Huita as possessing Sofrosini, it is not her wifely devotion that is being referenced but rather her desire to live in continence. Shortly after her marriage, Melania proposes to her husband, Pinion, that if he agrees to live with her in Sofrosini, she will allow him to be the master of her property. If, my lord, you are willing to practice chastity along with me and live with me in marriage, according to the law of continence, I contract to you, or I give you authority as a lord and master of my own life, and I place before you all of my possessions. Hereafter, you are master of them and may use them as you wish. If only you will leave my body free, so I may present it spotless with my soul to Christ. As perhaps the wealthiest woman in the later Roman Empire, Melania offers Pinion control of her vast fortune, positioning her wealth as a reasonable exchange for preserving her Sofrosini. Pinion offers a compromise, agreeing to live in chastity after they produce two children to inherit their many possessions a decision Melania begrudgingly accepts. Nevertheless, as her geographer narrates, she still kept trying to leave him all of her possessions and flee. After two children are born and die prematurely, Pinion accepts Melania's desire for chastity, and they both leave behind their home and live as ascetics, distributing their wealth. The Sofrosini Melania yearned for was not feminine virtue associated with the good wife, but rather the masculine self-restraint of a late antique philosopher or theologian. And curiously, the text asserts that this type of Sofrosini can be bought for a price. Though Melania was unsuccessful in bribing her own husband, the hagiographer describes that she, quote, yearned so exceedingly for Sofrosini that by money and admonitions, she persuaded many young men and women to stay clear of licentiousness and an impure manner of life, quote. Though she could not preserve her own body untouched, Melania purchases the chastity of others. The Sofrosini of the 5th century abbess Matrona of Pergi is more in line with Gorgonios at first, but of course with key differences. As an aristocratic matron and mother in Constantinople, Matrona left behind her husband, Dometianos, and young daughter to live as a eunuch monk, who later founded a prominent convent in the imperial city. Despite renouncing her family, Matrona's 6th century hagiography portrays her as a Sophron matron, whose virtues closely match the Greco-Roman ideal of the good wife. After her marriage, Matrona was humble and moderate, taking no care whatsoever for adornments and cosmetics that worldly women are accustomed to use, cultivating instead manners of piety and Sophrosini. However, shortly after this description, we see a quick departure from this model dutiful wife. Matrona neglected all indulgence of the body, neither being nor allowing intercourse with her husband, being mindful of the blessed Paul saying that those that have wives should be as though they had none. Matrona refuses to sleep with her husband, Demetianos, who stands in direct opposition to both cultural expectations for wives and the teachings of most Christian writers on the role of sexual relations within marriage. The text justifies Matrona's actions with a quote from 1 Corinthians 7, that those that have wives should be as though they had none. This line, however, is deliberately misrepresented or perhaps misunderstood in the text 
to the point of irony for the reader well-versed in scripture. 1 Corinthians 7 famously chides women not to deny their husbands for a wife does not have the authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. 1 Corinthians 7, 4. And also forbids women from leaving their husbands. Corinthians 7, 10. Most patristic writers interpret Paul's phrase that those that have, ri that those that have wives should be as though they had none to refer to the end of the world, emphasizing the importance of chastity and continence in contrast to the teachings of Genesis to be fruitful and multiply. Paul was not encouraging husbands to separate from their wives or wives from their husbands, but rather that spouses gradually sow the seeds of chastity into their marriages, much in the manner of Gorgonia and her husband. In addition to spurning her husband, Matrona is also noticeably absent from her home, preferring to spend her nights at all night vigils in churches and in martyr shrines. When Demetrianos mistakenly takes Matrona's nightly absences to mean that she's associating with or living as a courtesan, he locks her in the house, as you can see in this passage here. Shortly after this episode, Matrona abandons her husband and child to live disguised as a eunuch monk. When her beleaguered husband comes looking for her at the monastery gates, she has already left. Matrona travels throughout the Near East, casting out demons, working miracles, and gaining disciples, before establishing a, constant, a convent in Constantinople around 457. Matrona's Uxorial Sofrosini, however, is ultimately transformed from that of an unwilling wife and mother into a continent ascetic and spiritual mother to her nuns and lay disciples. Matrona's abandonment of her husband, child, and wealth becomes central to her sanctity and a model for her own disciples some of, which, some of whom leave behind their own families in a similar manner to join her monastery. In conclusion, the definition of feminine Sofrosini as an ideal virtue of Greco-Roman women remained consistent, but the fifth century's emphasis on chastity and virginity shifted the scale of virtues for Christian women in ascetic discourse. Hagiographies of married ascetics from the mid fifth and sixth centuries indicate that serving one's family and household was no longer a primary path to virtue or the primary path to virtue, and that sanctity could be obtained by rejecting or refashioning traditional female roles. Matrons who had renounced their families could become mothers anew through the adoption of spiritual children. While traditional modes of feminine sofrosini were still valued in these texts, as Matrona is a clear example, her virtue nevertheless departs from the Greco-Roman model, showing how a virtue so domestic and tied to the family could be applied to women who rejected its very foundations in search of Christian salvation. This refashioning of feminine sofrosini as an ascetic virtue opened up new possibilities for defining female Christian sanctity and ascetic virtue in mid antiquity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anasia. Um, wait a moment while, here we go, where every, everyone comes back. Thank you, and let me open open the floor to questions. Open the screen. Okay. Michelle. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. That was really lovely. I just had, I wanted to have your thoughts about um, one aspect of female ascetic uh, women that I've always sort of pondered. Um, and wondered what you make of them is the the women you know uh, like the wife of Pelanus of Nola, for instance, who remains um, uh, living with him in chastity. Uh, do you see more? I guess I just want to ask you more about how that kind of um, behavior gets praised more. I mean. You know, the, the spectacular renunciations of the world, the millennials who leave entirely. But, um, you know, I wonder, I wonder if you can fill out a bit more about some of the praises that attach to women who live with their husbands, but, you know, separate in, in, in asceticism and how that other model um, coexist so what happens to it you know the other possibility um so the, the example you gave of, of matrona of Perge, she's she's in conflict with her husband about it but what about all those women who 
with whom with whom you see happy relations? Do we have a different vocabulary, a different set of virtues attached to them? I'm just wondering. That's, if a, that's a great question. I haven't looked as much at the Latin examples um, with Pudicitia particularly. Um, it's interesting though, in I've been looking in the Greek geography um, for my dissertation, and there definitely seems to still be for most of the examples, a bit of conflict. And sometimes it's um, not necessarily uh, the husband preventing the wife, but rather there's some other sort of block in mind. Um, but I've noticed that once, once that separation is made, these women are usually no longer referred to as sofron. And in fact, um, I've also noticed as well that it doesn't seem to be the case that um, in, in antiquity, single women could also possess sofrosini or sofrosune. Um, but in late antiquity, this seems to be really a virtue of the married and particularly the women that stay, in, that stay with their husbands. Melania, for example, the younger and Matrona are no longer described as possessing that virtue as soon as sort of their marriages are sort of separate um, and they live in continents. And um, the example of Gorgonia, of course, she passes away shortly after she and her husband make this vow, um, she's no longer described that was possessing that afterwards. So I, I almost wonder if, um, so yes, the wife of you know, of Nola, even though she remains with her husband and um, even Melania sort of remains close with Pinion. They are always sort of in the same sort of sphere, mm. but she's no longer described as, as having that virtue. So this is something that I would love to explore more um, and see if this is, Something that is only sort of. Um, they're, they're there just for the conflict. Once you know, once they've won the conflict, they're no longer relevant. You know, if there isn't conflict, they're no longer relevant. I mean, it's a, it's a peculiar. It seems to me a peculiar um, silencing in a way, um, in, a, in a certain sense, because you know you, you know, there are letters addressed to Pelanus and his wife, but you don't really hear anything else, more about what she does, even though she's just as actively engaged in an ascetic lifestyle. So right. I mean, that's just the one example I'm thinking about at the moment, but uh, I'd be curious to hear if you if you see another set of possibilities for women who remain married and what, what, what the virtues might be. So and I, I wonder too if, if, if a descriptor for them would actually be more yeah. like enkratia or something, something more almost in more of like a the state of a, of a widowed woman as opposed to um, as opposed to a wife. And I'm not sure, but yes, I, I would love to look into that more. Thank you very much. And I do see, I see Noel, your, your hand, but just to follow this train of thought for a moment, as you were speaking, Anisia, it, it struck me how totally absent any sort of female interiority is from these texts that you're discussing. Um, I mean, you quoted that uh, Kyle Harper saying that Pudikitia or Sophrosine was a state of body and of mind, but there's no sense of in a struggle or in a dedication. I mean, that, that life of Melania retrojects onto what in fact must have been an incredibly turbulent period in Melania and Pinion's life of, you know, the, the children and the loss of the children and, and so on, retrojects this focused and enduring purpose. Um, and it was that moment actually that, that made me think, absent from all these is any sense of whether it be struggle or just the inner effort to self-dedicate to this to this type of life. I, I offer that merely as a comment, and as I say, I can see Noel's hands up. Um, but thank you. Noel. Thank you, and thank you, Anisia, for a great talk. And I was wondering if we could turn back to your um, passage that Catherine was just talking about, the Melania um, passage on the slideshow. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, the just um, curious, to, obviously, I'm kind of obsessed with slavery, but all the slavery language that's here. So if my Lord, so um, Kirie Mu, um, and that's obviously the word both for um, a lord, but a property owner and a slave owner, so a master. Um, and of course, it's also the word for a guardian in um, legal documents, a, a male guardian of a female. But then particularly at the end of um, the passage, um, 
where it says uh, another master word there. Um, um, so uh, after your ellipses there, prokendai uh, soi hapanda mu tahupar kunta hun until then edit espotes genomenos crece kathos bule. So um, all that property tahupar kunta. Um, of mine o over which you as lord despotes and that's another good slave um, master word um, you you as slave um, uh, uh, may wish you may use um, so that that is the manumission word right um, provided that you free my body and soma is of course often a word for slavery um, uh, in order um, that and then uh, your translation um, uh, um, Hina tuto son uh, sun tepsuke mu uh, aspilon paratis to Christo, um, uh, so that I can present it spotless to Christ. So it's a it's a manu it's it's a request for manumission basically from her husband um, that that um, you can keep the other property um, that's mine, but you can't keep my body um, as property, um, which I thought was um, interesting and uh, get, gets at some of the problem I think that Catherine was identifying that um, these women are struggling for some kind of a realm of control um, and their uh, virginity as, or, or at least their, um, their sofrosune, as you point out, um, is one area where they can gain that. Matrona can't gain that um, and her husband won't let her be free. So she has to run away, um, but the rest of them really are in a kind of struggle for control of their own bodies. In this language of slavery you see um, replicated by you know, Jerome and you know, many other church fathers, of course, um, who are trying to convince young women not to marry and to you know, remain as consecrated virgins. Um, so I, it would be interesting to see. I, I've seen this, of course, a lot in, in the Latin text, but to look more into the Greek and see um, how that might be represented. It's very, very interesting. I also have my um, dragon if anyone wants to see it, but I'd have to be able to share a screen. You could put you could, um, you could put it in the chat, no? Um, I, I actually hesitate to do that because it was sent to me in pre-publication okay. and the people yeah. said, don't share this. <laughs> um, so I could, but yeah, um, anyway, uh, we, we, I won't worry about it. We'll be in touch, thank you. I think we may have to leave. <laughs> leave the dragon I, I do i do i just want to, again to follow up no Noel's point i mean it does it gives a sense of the the violence of this struggle if we if we make the state slave language that is so smoothed over in these texts but i think um we need perhaps the imaginative um engagement combined with that sort of close reading that noel was just doing to, to prize this out of those texts. So thank you, thank you both very much. Thank you so much, Anisia. Um, and we move now from Gregory of Nazianzus to his great opponent, um, not Matthew Lupu, who's about to speak next. Um, Matthew from Florida State University, but of course, Julian. And Matthew's paper is entitled Julian's Platonopolis. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to try and share my screen here and I, I, I wanna see if this actually um, works. So hopefully it does. Do we see that? This is my, uh, my handout here. Yes. Okay, thank you so much. All right, well. Okay. Uh, among the extant writings by Julian the Apostate, and we have two exemplar of public address meant for the general consumption of two major Eastern cities, Alexandria and Antioch. Both these cities were centers of Hellenic culture and education. Uh, both cities would go on to become major centers of Christianity in the later phases of imperial history. But Julian's treatment of these cities in some ways so similar could not have been more different. For Antioch, I argue that Julian planned a future greatness that might have been meant to eclipse Constantinople. While as for Alexandria, Julian would not even so much as visit the city when Alexandria would erupt in anti-Christian violence and openly subvert the rule of law. Uh, 
Julian responds with his letter to the people of Alexandria and punishes no one. When the people of Antioch would fail to behave as Julian might have wanted, he appoints a new governor well known for his harshness to punish the city. Such uneven responses to two episodes in Julian's short reign demand explanation. Now, previous scholarship has viewed the episode at Alexandria as an example of Julian's anti-Christian bias. And it was precisely because the victim of mob violence was a Christian cleric that Julian would not severely punish the population of the city. Conversely, Julian's apparently difficult relationship with Antioch has been seen as an example of his asceticism and frankly odd interpretation of the pagan ethos clashing with the free-spirited nature of the Antiochenes. In this paper, I will attempt to demonstrate that Julian's journey to Antioch represents his selection of the city as his imperial capital. This decision comes not only from the practical, political, and military realities of his rule, but also from a desire to reform the culture and religion of the empire born from his understanding of Greek philosophy. His fraught interaction with the people of Antioch is demonstrated in the Mesopagon is a consequence of the mismatch between Julian's expectations for how a city ought to be ruled and the real results of putting political theory into practice. To make this argument, I'll first answer a series of questions. What does Greek philosophy mean to Julian? What is Julian's understanding of the role of emperor? Does Julian view Antioch as a kind of Platonopolis of the sort that Plotinus attempted to construct under the reign of Gallienus? If Julian is indeed interested in creating his Platonopolis, then why choose Antioch instead of Athens or Alexandria, the two cities which gave home to Plato's academy and its later successors? I will attempt to touch on all of these points and to present a first step towards a more cohesive understanding of Julian's style of governance and its relationship to his philosophy. While there is some scholarly debate about the exact time frame of Julian's so-called conversion from Christianity to paganism, there's no doubt that by the time Julian was called to court by Constantius II, he was a committed pagan. The exact nature of Julian's philosophy is difficult to reconstruct in toto, but it's most commonly attributed to Iamblichus, Porphyry, and Plotinus. There are no extant writings of Julian that systematically espouse in a comprehensive manner what his philosophical beliefs were. And this fact has not stopped scholars from making several inferences into his philosophy from his more explicitly philosophical works. For example, close readings of Julian's letters indicate that he fundamentally viewed the philosophy of Aristotle and Plato to be in agreement. And he recommended that the works of Epicurus be ignored entirely. We can infer from his orations that Julian saw the ultimate goal um, of the practice of philosophy was to achieve some type of divinity. Um, he's explicit about this fact in oration 7225, um, the first on the handout. So too in philosophy, uh, the end and the beginning are one, namely to know oneself and to become like the gods. That is to say the first principle is self-knowledge and the end of conduct is the resemblance to the higher powers. Is there a connection then between achieving some kind of personal divinity and the way one interacts with the real world? To put a finer point on this question, could Julian have been interested in applying his philosophy to affect real world change? Previous philosophers in Julian's pedigree engaged in lengthy and complex debates about exactly how engaged with the greater world a philosopher ought to be and what the practical effects of philosophical attainment were. Julian addresses this point in his letter to Themistius. In that work, he argues with Themistius about Epicurus's recommendation to live in obscurity, uh, handout number two. Apparently, Themistius was of the same opinion as Epicurus, as Julian admonishes him for saying, um, now for my part, I have long been firmly convinced that Epicurus was mistaken in that view of his. Uh, he goes further, explaining that he has always preferred a life of toil to one of retirement as recommended by Epicurus. And he's still even more explicit, explaining that as difficult as it is for him to deal with the burdens of empire, he must emulate those famous men, Solon, Lycurgus, Pittacus, uh, but also that I must now quit the shades of philosophy for the open air, as Themistius himself had encouraged him to do, which you can see in handout number four. 
Uh, it should be noted here that both Solon and Pittacus are two of Plato's seven sages as listed in the Protagoras. Lycurgus, as the originator of the Spartan constitution, also serves as an influence on Plato in his laws and in the Republic. Plato invokes these men as paradigms to be studied in order to better understand the practicalities of law and government, as does, I argue, Julian. Julian's attitude here should not be surprising given the previous attempts of philosophers to become intimately involved in politics. Plato himself serves as a model for this kind of philosophical intervention. In his seventh letter, Plato describes his involvement in public life and how it shaped his views on the subject. He addresses this point several times, explaining his intention in going to Sicily in the first place was to advise Dion about how best to rule, um, which you can see on handout number five. Uh, Plato also has Socrates warn us in Republic 499c with some prophetic clarity, which is relevant today, neither city nor republic, nor in fact man likewise will not become perfect until philosophers can take control of the government. Um, and actually, that's on the next page here, there. Okay, furthermore, Plato does not see this circumstance as an impossibility and that if it were so, they would rightly be accused of merely speaking about wishes. And it's on this point that I suggest we understand the connection between divinization, as Dominic O'Meara defines it, and political life Omira defines divinization as the assimilation of man to God, a concept that is central to Neoplatonic philosophy. His conception of Neoplatonic politics is one whereby political virtue can serve as a first preparatory stage in the ascent of the soul to higher levels of divine life. And since political virtue itself images divine life, the philosopher can descend so as to bring this divine life to expression on the political level. I argue that Julian saw his involvement with the affairs of empire precisely in these terms, since it explains Julian's exhortation that a prince must be divine and a demigod in his behavior. This connection to Plato is made even more overt in the same letter when Julian says in his epistle to Themistius, to me at any rate, it seems that the task of reigning is beyond human powers and that a king needs a more divine character as indeed Plato too used to say. Now, in light of Plato's recommendation in Republic 499c, Julian's position becomes clearer. He's telling Themistius that the ideal ruler must perfect himself first, the man, by becoming as much like a god as possible before he can perfect his city, the polis, with the ultimate goal of perfecting the state, the politeia. We can find evidence of Julian's conceit of himself as having reunited with a kind of platonic good in his oration seven. I contend that the contents of the autobiographical myth therein bear a striking resemblance to Plato's allegory of the cave. In Julian's myth, Hermes appears before him and leads him to a mountain where the rest of the gods reside. On this mountain, Helios reveals himself to Julian in a vision. He asks him to, he asks to stay with the gods but they tell him that he must return to the world of men. This mirrors the ascent of the prisoner living in the dark world of the cave and his ascent to the light followed by his descent back into the cave. When Hermes leads Julian to the mountain, he warns him in language reminiscent of Plato that there he will meet with the greatest danger. This greatest danger is to take from the father of the gods at the summit of the mountain, whatever is best, Whereas Plato describes the greatest danger in the Republic as to choose the best of what is possible at all times. The language shared between Plato and Julian's autobiographical myth, if intentional, is important. The similarities between Julian and Plato do not end with his ascent of the mountain. After his transformative experience on the summit, he is ordered to return back to earth just as the prisoner must go back to the cave. The summit of the mountain is filled with light, but the earth is covered by the thickest mist imaginable where the light of King Helios penetrates only very faintly. At this point in Oration 7, Julian receives his divine mission to return to earth in order to cleanse all impiety with the help of Helios and Athena and all the other gods. Just like the prisoner returning to the cave, this mission will be fraught and dangerous. And Helios tells him before he departs back to earth that if he remembers his commands, he will become a god and will behold his heavenly father. 
Given these similarities between Julian's myth and Plato, it's my contention that the real purpose of the autobiographical myth is to communicate to his audience his reunion with the one or the universal soul. That is to say that he has become as close to a God as possible. Now, returning to the connection between the perfection of man, city, and state as outlined in the Republic, we can understand Julian as the man who, having perfected himself through the study of through study and divine counter, has the ability and knowledge to create a perfect city. Julian as philosopher king is in a position to do what Plotinus could not. He can and should build a Callipolis for himself. While the argument for Julian's vision of Antioch as the Callipolis is necessarily limited by the sources extant to us, perhaps the best piece of evidence for Julian's greater plan comes from Libanius, who cast Julian in the role of a new Augustus when he says that he wanted to make Antioch into a city of marble. There's also extant evidence from Julian's letters that seem to hint at a greater plan for appropriating Christian institutions for the Hellenic church as, G as Julian might have conceived it. For example, in his letter to uh, Erascius, uh, Julian orders the pagan authority to establish hostels or xenodikeia for travelers and that grain be made available for the hungry because he considers it disgraceful that when no Jew ever has to beg and the impious Galileans support not only their own poor but ours as well, all men see that our people lack aid from us. Bowersock notes that Julian's letters, uh, which are dated to the time that Julian is crossing over from Anatolia to Syria, show the zeal with which he endeavored to stimulate the cause of paganism. While it's clear that he was eminently concerned with reestablishing the primacy of a kind of religious Hellenism or a pagan church as co-conceived of it, we can only infer from comparatively little evidence that he meant for this project to be headquartered at Antioch, which leads us to the Mesopagon. Given the greater evidence for Julian's presumed motivations uh, presented in this paper, we might gain a better understanding for the context of his Mesopagon. If he saw himself as a philosopher king on a divine mission to perfect his politeia, which was meant to serve as an example to all of his citizens to also become as like a god as possible, then he was an abysmal failure. Not only was he unsuccessful in his attempts, but he knew that he failed. We might imagine a Julian convinced that by virtue of his philosophical training, his exemplum would be irresistible to his citizens because these were the very promises made to students of philosophy. But Julian's paganism and his prescription to climb the ladder of virtue via asceticism would do nothing but aggravate the population of the East, when Julian, which Julian considered to be addicted to luxury. Perhaps more serious than this, he would be frustrated by the failure of his philosophical training to provide relief from the real social and political problems that the Antiochenes were facing at the time. In the Mesopagon, we read that despite his attempts to alleviate the food crisis in Antioch by expanding the boule of the city, he found local elites took his generosity and used it for their own enrichment. This is the exact opposite of the outcome predicted by Julian's understanding of philosophy. Hence Julian's disillusionment with the city that he had such high hopes for as his potential capital. Perhaps Julian's failure read in this context better explains the unique tone of the Mesopagon. Could Julian build his Platonopolis? Plato apparently tried and did not succeed, as did Plotinus. Julian tried as well, and he was doomed to fail. There is at least some circumstantial evidence that he intended to try again after his Persian campaign, this time in Tarsus. But perhaps more, more important than his failure is the fact that he tried it all with the zeal of the converted that only a sincere belief in his own philosophy could muster. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Matthew. And yes, and questions from, from the screen. <laughs> Um, I have a question. Um, thank you for that very interesting paper. I 
can I push you in a different direction than what you seem to have gone? And uh, in particular, I'm curious about the fact that the Julian's letter to Themistius quotes verbatim from Plato's laws. Um, and I do find it interesting that um, in Porphyry's description of the attempt by Plotinus to build a Platonopolis, um, he explicitly states that the Platonopolis would be built upon the laws, um, which I find to be interesting since the Callipolis seems to be a better model for a bunch of philosophers who want to escape from the rest of the world. Um, but in any case, so I'm wondering what you make of the fact that Julian quotes so extensively from Plato's laws. Um, and according to Jean Bufartigue in his big book on Julian and Greek culture, he states that Julian is unique um, in his quotations um, from the laws, especially given the fact that the laws seem to be left out of uh, the Platonic curriculum um, as attributed to Iamblichus. Um, and uh, Bufartigue says, you only see the laws making much of an impact in Plutarch and then again in Julian, and it's sort of left out by all the so-called, you know, what we would might call professional philosophers, the professional Platonists of late antiquity. So in any case, so I'm just, uh, uh, I'm just wondering what you make of that, uh, of uh, his relationship to the laws. Um, and it's odd to me that it's actually in a letter in which he's claiming, I don't want to be too involved in politics. So there's an irony to all of that as well, at least in my mind, there's an irony to all of that. So anyway, do you have any thoughts um, about what he might be up to with the laws? Yeah, um, first of all, I mean, I, I, think, that's, I think that's spot on. Um, I, I basically, the reason I sort of didn't get too in the weeds with the laws is because I think that the argument I'm trying to make here is um, difficult to do uh, given that, you know, there is no source that I could find, and, and I, I can't find any, any, anybody, you know, really commenting um, that, uh, that the attempt should be made to try and govern a, a real life city based on um, anything that, uh, that Plato has written. Um, so, you know, there, there's, a, there's a question, as, as, at least as I read it, um, you know, what exactly is the purpose of uh, committing all of this to uh, paper or to print in the first place? Meaning, you know, is this, you know, are these rules meant to, to sort of serve as a thought experiment and, you know, need to go through a round of interpretation before they can be applied? Is there anything to, um, does it make any sense to try and apply them just, you know, purely as they are written? And you know, I, I think I think the argument would be um, framed differently if uh, there was some kind of uh, instruction booklet that you know that that basically was explicit, saying that if you do the following things, um, this is the result that will happen. So we should start doing them right now, if that makes sense. So, um, but in terms of uh, in terms of going back and digging into the laws, um, I. I'm sort of interested in developing this idea into a paper um, or into an article rather. Um, and that's something that I want to uh, sort of get into the weeds with um, and sort of haven't just yet. Um, but it's sort of, it's, it's the idea is, uh, is a good one. I, and I think that that is the, you know, the direction that the paper needs to go in. Um, so I, I think you're right. If that makes any sense. <laughs> Yeah, one just one comment to follow up. Um, it, I hope I'm not. I think I may have interrupted somebody, but just a very quick comment um, to follow up is that um, Bufartig actually takes this sort of minimalist approach. I mean, he basically says, "I don't, we don't know anything about whether or not um, Julian actually had whole texts of Plato," and so he really sort of tries to build up an argument. I think in a good sort of way. But I do just want to comment Eusebius's Praeparatio Evangelica quotes more of the laws than any other text in all of late antiquity. And we know Julian read Eusebius's Praeparatio because he faults Eusebius in his Contra Galileos. So I sometimes wonder if he's actually channeling the laws as he had read 
large swaths of it um, uh, in Eusebius. But that's just a comment that I'm throwing out there. Yeah. Thank no, thank you though. That's the, I, I didn't I didn't even think about that. That's a that's a good point. Yeah. Thank you so much, Aaron. Um, Jeremy, did I see you waving a hand? If you unmute. Always do that. All right. Thank you, Matthew, for that excellent paper. Um, um, I got a lot out of it. Um, I got uh, two things. Uh, first, um, this I've been thinking about this the whole time because I've been working on something like this. But uh, your mention of the of Libanius kind of comparing uh, Julian to Augustus, uh, I think, really com uh, fits in with the discourse of imperial refoundation, as you know, from Angelova's book. Um, so I. Um, would definitely like to see how um, everything you've talked about kind of fits into how he's inheriting that from the Roman side of things. Um, uh, second, which is sort of related, um, I'm not entirely convinced uh, that um, Julian is has any particular city, um, physical city in mind. Um, you know, for, for instance, I don't think he would think about, you know, an idea of transferring the capital um, to Antioch because, you know, the capital, even at this point, is still referred to as Rome. Um, and he calls in the hymn to Helios, Rome is, you know, our city um, and, and elsewhere, I think. Um, so it could be that when he thinks about this platonic po or neoplatonic politeia, um, that he's not referring to a particular polis, perhaps the cosmopolis okay, of the Roman Empire, which is the world to him, um, of which he is um, the Basileus um, and the Viceroy of the, you know, of Basileus Helios here. Um, so that's, that's sort of what, how I would interpret his approach here. Um, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, I mean, it, it's, it's definitely an interesting point. And I, I think you're, you're probably right in terms of the way that he's, you know, seeing the entirety of the empire as being I, I like I like the idea of cosmopolis. I think that that actually kind of captures it really well. Mm -hmm. um, the only uh, thing that I you know, am, I, I, and and I guess I guess maybe I'm not quite so clear on this is you know how do we define capital? Um, mm -hmm. How do we define capital city, especially at this time, um, you know, in Roman history? I, I'm I'm thinking to myself. Um, and maybe I should be more explicit with this, you know, if and when I ever get this thing written up, mm -hmm. um, is wherever the emperor is or wherever the emperor is going to, you know, use as a headquarters for like a military campaign or something like that, is that safe to call that a temporary capital or a capital for the year or something like that? You know, not really to, to make the argument that, you know, the capital, maybe we call it the capital with a capital C is meant to be moved. Um, away from Rome, because I agree. I mean, you know, the the, you know, clearly in in their conception, you know, Rome is you know, special, um, and and not. Uh, I I wouldn't make the argument that anybody's trying to you know, you know, devalue or degrade the status of Rome as the original capital, mm -hmm. but perhaps uh, you know, when when we when we do find uh, stories of the emperor making a winter camp in uh, Lugdunum uh, for however long that is, and brings all the apparatus of empire with him, you know, to that temporary court, does that count as a capital? And maybe that's what, it, what, it, what, the, what, I'm, what I'm getting at in this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the capital is wherever the emperor is, and the yeah. emperor is the capital rather than whatever city, I think is what's going exactly. on. So anyway, hey, thanks a lot again. No, thank you. So we've had, we've had two questions from from um, an educated point of view. May I ask one from ignorance? Which in in the middle of your paper, you referred to Julian. I think I'm remembering correctly as a divine and semi-divine figure. Presumably, you were differentiating those intentionally. What do you mean? What does what does that mean? I mean, this is truly a question from ignorance. Yeah, no, no. Um, that's that's a that, it's a great question because um, I, I think the answer is is I, I'm not quite sure, right? Um, you know, it, it it seems to me that the promise that's being made um, that comes along with the mastery of these texts is that um, is that you you are the 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 student, I guess, you know, is imparted with a certain 
divine character because you're able to commune with you know the cosmos right the universal soul the one um and you know th this sort of you know touches on uh you know, to, I, and i hesitate to bring it up here but i mean it, it's it almost it almost is reminiscent of the you know the problems um that you know christology faces you know is how divine and how human is somebody after going through this kind of training um, and I don't know that there's a straightforward answer to that. Um, I mean, or at least there's not one that I would be, you know, willing to argue right now. <laughs> so I'm intrigued you bring that up just because um, there's a fantastic essay by Susanna Elm uh, yeah. in a in the um, collection I just edited with Simon Goldhill. Have you have you seen that? Is is this new? Is it, is it worth it's, 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 brand, it's brand new. There's no reason okay. for you to have seen it. It came out in September. Um, but she is precisely flipping the usual narrative and arguing that specifically animated statues of Julian um, actually provide some sort of model for Christology, for, for, for the incarnation. So I, I think if you do reflect further on that, do, do take a look at that essay. Yeah, thank, thank you. That's, that's, that's actually excellent. I, I, would, I would love to read that, yeah. And Jeremy, again. Yeah, um, if I may, um, yeah, responding to that question. So yeah, I, I think about that question a lot. And, you know, for instance, I, I disagree with David Greenwood's, uh, you know, uh, conception that Julian thought that he was any sort of higher form of being. Um, and he, and Julian says explicitly in the letter of Themistius this, you know, I'm not like Dionysus or Heracles. I'm just a regular old soul, um, perhaps sent on a mission to, um, you know, to um, improve the empire and all that. Um, but um, you know, he's definitely going from the Theotetus where it's becoming more godlike, okay, not becoming a god. There's a difference there. Um, and so um, I think um, that is where he's coming from here, um, claiming, you know, not to be of a superior divine status, um, but um, somebody who has achieved that divine union and become more godlike um, so that they're in a position to act not only become ontologically like more like the gods, um, that's not the right word to use, but to do the things that the gods do, which is, you know, uh, shower benefits upon the material world. Okay, so um, that's just, sorry to interject myself again. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Um, Matthew, thank you. Thank you so much um, for, the paper, for your contribution. And I feel like we, we need a seventh inning stretch at this point, but uh, let's let's uh, press on through uh, our our final paper. Um, Charles Cooper, lately of the Thesaurus Linguae Latinae, uh, he is giving us paper under the title "Column Cryptography: The Theodosian Obelisk as Cipher for the Fictional Life of Theodulus the Stylite." Uh, Charlie. So unmute. Uh, you, you are unmuted. Okay, and you can see my PowerPoint is what what is up. Is that correct? Oh wait, hold on. There we go. Okay, so I. Um, I sent her on a link um, to my handout. Um, it should be on a, a public Dropbox. So it's not necessary. I'll be refer referring to it in passing, but uh, it's there if you'd like it. Um, he, uh, the PowerPoint and the paper itself uh, handled the talk on its own. Um, so let's see. Let's do that. OK. <clears throat> So sometime around the turn of the first millennium, one of the most impressive manuscripts still extant from the Middle Byzantine period was commissioned and produced, the so-called Menologian of Basil II, more properly a Synaxarion, which contains about 430 textual entries and illuminations for saints from the first half of the liturgical calendar. I begin with this particular diptych, not only because of the striking images of stylites, but also because it serves as a useful starting point for thinking about the history of this form of monasticism. Stylitism was by and large a late antique phenomenon. And though there have been numerous resurgences or revivals since, they are always anchored to this tradition in some way. 
Luke, who died in the mid 10th century, is a case in point. Here he is physically associated with his late antique predecessor. And in his contemporary Vita, his hagiographer explicitly names him as a successor to the four most famous late antique stylites, and that's handout one. Now, of course, there were many stylites in late antiquity, both men and women. And as you can see from this image, the majority of them were concentrated in Syria. But the importance of the canonical four is difficult to overestimate. All of them have extensive hagiographies that were read, copied, and translated for centuries. They were depicted in art. Pilgrims traveled to visit their monumental cult sites and monasteries both before and after the deaths. And they carried pilgrimage tokens stamped with their image across the entire Mediterranean world. These four were the following. Simeon the Elder, Daniel, Simeon the Younger, and Olypius. My paper today, however, is about none of these four saints. Rather, it is about the outlier, the embarrassment, the enigma, the fictional Theodulus the Stylite and his very curious Vita. Surviving in a single 11th century manuscript, the life of Theodulus is unlike any other extant Greek hagiography describing the life of the Stylite. Its peculiarities can be um, summarized in the following three points. One, where the column often becomes center stage in other texts for the, uh, for the saint's theatrical feats of endurance, this text is remarkably apathetic about Theodulus' stylitism. Two, the hagiography does not cast its hero in an entirely favorable light. And three, the author gives almost no historical context for his saint and what he includes is problematic. According to the text, Theodulus was the urban prefect of Constantinople during the reign of Theodos Theodosius I, which is certainly not true. And this chronology also implies that Theodulus was a stylite before Simeon the Elder, the well-attested first stylite, who was a child during the reign of Theodosius II, or the first. And this is handout two. <clears throat> These points summarize Hippolyte Delahaye's negative interpretation of this text, as it is found in his magisterial 1923 study of, of stylites, the stylite saints. For the great Bolandus scholar, the life of Theodulus was nothing more than a crude Christian romance with no historical merit of any sort. Even its religious theme, that almsgiving is generally a nice thing to do, was unoriginal and derived from other sources according to him. This dismissive interpretation, I think, is responsible for why scholarship in the past century is almost completely silent on this text, and why there has been no new edition of the Greek text since the 17th century Editio Princeps until my own. The editor of this edition, I think, serves as a nice counterpoint to Delahaye's more critical view. Daniel Cardono, the 17th century editor, took a more charitable approach. His first inclination was to take what he read at face value and search for corroborating evidence. He pored over the Theodosian Codex and he determined that Theodulus, the urban prefect, could have lived between the years 387 and 391. Although this clever hypothesis is factually inaccurate, Cardano, I think, was closer to the truth than Delahaye was. And this approach should remind us, as we shall see, that we are oftentimes better served if we do not default to scoffing disbelief when reading ancient hagiography. During the rest of my paper, I propose a middle way for reading this text. As I will show, the life of Theodulus is neither a brainless romance, nor is it a historical account of a saint and his pious conduct. Rather, the life of Theodulus is a cleverly crafted parody that caricatures and revels in its winking inversion of its historical subtext. This parody, which is uh, accomplished through a kaleidoscope of learned critiques, serves to criticize the ostentatious ascetic behavior of stylites specifically, and investigates the validity of asceticism as superior to marriage in the path to Christian sanctity more broadly. During the rest of my time, I will give a summary of the Vita. Then I will briefly discuss two other aspects of parody before focusing on the core theme of the paper, the play with the historical subtext and how the Theodosian obelisk is a critical key and unlock, 
in unlocking this very fact. I will end by drawing some conclusions about the text and pointing to avenues for further exploration. Uh, this is also on handout three, uh, if you have it. <clears throat> so the life of Theodulus neatly consists of two parts and can be summarized as follows. One day, Theodulus decides to leave his wife Procla and his position as urban prefect in Constantinople to travel east and live a life of extreme asceticism. <clears throat> he achieves the latter by feigning an illness and receiving a release from the emperor. The former is more difficult. Though he is initially bested by Procla's counter arguments and biblical acumen, the saint is freed from his duties as a husband when he is informed of her imminent death by Christ in a dream vision. Theodulus promptly buries his wife, donates all their possessions to the poor, and then travels east to Edessa. After uh, living as an enclosed recluse for two years, he purchases a column and becomes a stylite, which marks the midpoint of the text. As decades pass without comment, the second half of the life begins with the saint praying that God reveal his heavenly co-heir. His prayer is answered, but the response is unwelcome. Theodulus breaks into a pitiful lament upon learning that his equal is none other than a seedy musician named Cornelius who lives in Damascus. He nevertheless journeys to the city and discovers his equal departing the Hippodrome with a dancer. Cornelius is initially unwilling to divulge his secret act of virtue, but finally relents. What follows is a touching story within a story account. One night, Cornelius solicited an extraordinarily beautiful prostitute. Although she accepted his proposition, she immediately began crying when he reached out to touch her. Asked what was wrong, she in turn related the following story. She was given in marriage to a respectable man, but her husband soon squandered his money and her dowry as well, resulting in his imprisonment. For eight months, the nameless woman found no one to help her, and she failed to secure enough money by begging. At a breaking point, she decide, decided to prostitute herself to feed her husband and herself. Cornelius would have been her first client. Cornelius is filled with compassion at her story, runs home and secures enough money to resolve her husband's debts. He gives it to the woman and they part ways. Theodulus is astounded at the story and returns to Edessa. He dies soon thereafter and meets Cornelius in heaven. His body is ceremoniously interred and posthumous miracles continue to occur to this very day. <clears throat> now, there is so much that can be said for this interesting text, such as its genre abnormalities, the conflict between its superstructure and embedded episodes, its high percentage of focalized direct narration, and the author's famili familiarity with and usage of legal language. But because of time, I will briefly discuss two aspects of parody before moving on to the obelisk. So the first element of parody comes from the life of Olypius the Stylite, a mid seventh century oration narrating the life and career of Olypius and his monastic communities. The author of the life of Theodulus uses the trajectory of Olypius's stylitic career as his model for his own portrayal of Theodulus. But while faithful, he made a number of pointed alterations. In fact, the author subverts every element that he borrows often having Theodulus act in the exact opposite way of Olypius. The result is a portrait of Theodulus as a sort of anti-stylite doppelganger who brazenly or ignorantly becomes a stylite by questionable means. <clears throat> Olypius, for example, first relates his intentions to become a stylite to his mother, who strongly encourages her son's decision and even joins her, his community. Theodulus relates his intentions to his wife, who vehemently opposes her husband, criticizes his immorality, and even dissuades him from his plan. Olypius travels eastward, presumably to Syria, but he returns home on the advice of a dream vision, content to practice his asceticism in his homeland. Theodulus simply travels east to Edessa with no further comment. Each saint then discovers his own column and spends two years as an enclosed recluse in preparation for ascending it but there is one critical difference. Olypius' hagiographer takes great pains to point out that all expenses associated with the purchase and preparation of the column were paid for by Olypius' supporters and friends. 
the saint had no hand in any monetary transaction because of his self-imposed poverty. The Adulis, on the other hand, casually buys the column himself, despite having donated all his possessions and his money to the poor just a few lines before. Finally, Olypius is compared to one of the most important models of Christian asceticism, Job, and as the orator boasts, Olypius surpassed him in virtue. The Adulis is also the subject of comparison, but he is juxtaposed with one of the lowest members of society, a musician from the Hippodrome. So the joke is simple, but effective. Theodulus is a really bad stylite. <clears throat> the second element of parody is related to the author's fondness for learned etymologies. As this Syriac manuscript shows, Theodulus, which means slave of God in Greek, is equivalent to the Coptic Pathmusius, which means the same. I am still looking for a true Greek Coptic gloss for this, but this linguistic connection was certainly intentional because the entire episode between Theodulus and Cornelius is a close adaptation of scenes found in the history of the monks of Egypt about the anchorite Pathnusius of Thebes. Yet just like before, the differences and alterations in the life of Theodulus to the source text are more important than its shared features. I will pass over the finer details, which are less important here, and avoid too much tedious intertext. I've given you a taste in handout five, um, if you're curious. But I will highlight here three key differences. First, the tone is different. Hafnusius relishes in meeting his peers and remains calm and in control throughout. Theodulus is emotional, unstable, and angry. Second, the resolution of the story is reversed. Hafnusius concludes his conversation by praising his interlocutor, but also by reminding him that he must become a monk to achieve full virtue, which he does, thereby reaffirming the superiority of monasticism. Cornelius continues his life as a musician and is praised for his secular lifestyle. And third, the details about the women whom Paphnutius and Cornelius helped are rearranged. Such small details might appear insignificant at first glance, but a pattern emerges when we read Cornelius's interaction with the nameless prostitute in light of Theodulus's with Procla. I admit that my interpretation of this passage is greatly compressed here, and I would be happy to expand on it later in the Q&A, but we can see that the author has coordinated the stories of Theodulus and Procla with Cornelius and this woman in such a way that we are encouraged to reread and reassess Theodulus's earlier treatment of Procla, and not positively. The criticism has more bite here. Not only is Theodulus a bad stylite, he is a cruel person. And finally, the next name game finally brings us to the monument in question, the Theodosian obelisk. As you recall, the claim that a man named Theodulus was urban prefect of Constantinople under Theodosius I is demonstrably false. But at the same time, such a claim in a generic or romantic hagiography is rather strange. It is very specific and therefore fairly easily falsifiable. What is more, the urban prefecture remained a significant position from the later Roman imperial hierarchy well into Middle Byzantium. So unsurprisingly, we do know the identity of the urban prefect during this period, and the connections between his career and that of Theodulus are immediately apparent. I speak of Proclus, often Proclus in Latin sources, hence the clever name of Theodulus's wife, Procla. Proclus was the son of Eutolmius Tatianus, who, was a very, who had a very successful political career over the course of the fourth century. Originally from Syria, he quickly rose to the ranks of the late antique Cursus Honorum, holding various governorships, as well as being comace of the East. He reached his pinnacle in 388 when he was appointed Praetorian Prefect of the East by Theodosius. And at the same time, Tatianus's son Proclus was named the Urban Prefect of Constantinople, a position which he held until 392 when he met his unfortunate demise. And this is handout 7A. Unfortunate is a bit of an understatement. From what our sources tell us, both Proclus and his father Tatianus were exiled by the emperor when false charges were brought against him by Flavius Rufinus. 
It is unclear exactly what Theodosius's role was in all of this because of the lack of evidence and the bias of our sources. But what is clear is that Tatsianus was tricked in convincing Proclus, his son, to emerge from hiding, whereupon the latter was brutally murdered, brutally murdered before his own father, who was then exiled himself to the east. Zosimus' account and Claudian's passing reference to it are found in handout 7b and 7c. And for a comprehensive overview of the sources and problems, the 1989 article by Rebenek is still probably the best resource for us. Less gruesome and more relevant is that for which Proclus is most well known, namely raising one of the most famous columns in the city of Constantinople, the Theodosian Obelisk which still remains standing in C2 in the Hippodrome today. Let's see it there. After Theodosius' defeat of Maximus Magnus, Proclus was entrusted with erecting this Egyptian obelisk, recently retrieved and damaged en route from Alexandria in the Hippodrome, which is amusingly depicted in the northeastern base of the obelisk. It's just a fantastic image. What is more, his leading role in this endeavor was inscribed in a bilingual verse inscription that can also still be read today. As scholars such as Linda Safran and Robert Osterhout have pointed out, the imperial language of Latin faces the palace while the Greek faces outward. And this is handout eight. What is equally important is that Proclus's name, which is prominently displayed next to that of Theodosius, has been conspicuously effaced through Demnatio Memoriae and subsequently replaced so that a later reader, even if uncertain of the details, would be sure that Proclus had come to some ill end within the context of the Theodosian court. You can see there, and I don't know if you can see my pointer, but yeah. So to review, we have Proclus, whose name is shared by Theodulus's wife who was the urban prefect of Constantinople under Theodosius, just as Theodulus allegedly was, who raised one of the most important columns in the Eastern Empire, just as the stylite Theodulus allegedly did, who was from Syria, where Theodulus allegedly yearned to live, and who was brutally murdered during the reign of Theodosius I, which is hinted at in the Vita during Theodosius' speech on Theodulus' behalf, and that's handout nine. But where does this leave us? Such a parody is clearly consonant with what we saw earlier, but what do we make of it? Is it, as the title of my paper suggests, a sort of cipher, a material real world object that unlocks the literary fiction? Considering that this obelisk was and remains one of the most well-known and visited monu monuments in Constantinople, I think this is entirely likely. It was certainly my entry point into unlocking this text for myself. Furthermore, and I am happy to admit that this may be overreaching, but I am also inclined to think that part of the joke is the very identity of the object itself, the literal and literary significance of the obelisk. What I mean by this is that the material obelisk, which stands as a, as a historical document informing our understanding of this ancient text, has also become a physical, literary, critical symbol, the obeliscus, the mark of what is spurious and false. I refer you to two passages from Isidore of Seville, and I'll let you decide for yourself if, if that's an overreach. But finally, and more broadly, what have we gained, that's hand up time. What have we gained in our understanding about the life of Theodulus, and where is there to go from here? As for the former, I think it is now clear that we have a more satisfying and enriching way forward than before for reading and understanding the life of Theodulus. That is, as a literary fiction that critiques and plays with established social and literary norms. Most obviously, this criticism is aimed at and lampoons an extreme stereotype of Christian asceticism, namely the stylite. And there is much room for nuance and conversation here. I also think that there is much more to be explored and uncovered. For one, I am still not sure what to make of the figure and name of Cornelius and his home city. Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, of course. But if the texts were composed at the end of the seventh century, I do wonder if there is something political going on with the Umayyad Caliphate 
and its capital in Damascus, one of many things that deserves further consideration. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charlie. That's uh, almost vertiginously rich, I would say. Um, I imagine people will have questions or comments if you, once you've um, taken us out of your screen. Thank you. Okay. Great. So let me let me ask first. Do, do you think it is? Do you think the purpose of composition of this text is to be found in the Umayyad context? And why why compose this? I mean, you're, you're making a fantastic argument for it being this elaborate parody, but why? Yeah, I mean, my first inclination, and I think the safest bet, is as a a literary critique and a social critique of, of trends in Christian aesthetic and pious behavior. Um, and it's just a jolly good time to make fun of stylites, I think. Um, and the political significance is only recently dawned on me, and I don't have a whole lot to say on it because, I mean, the author seems to be, if I had to guess, some sort of legal scholar from the city of Constantinople. He's very familiar with both Christian literature and the sort of history of the Roman Empire and so on, but shows next to no knowledge or concern, at least ostensibly, with, with the caliphate and outside of the empire and so on. So, I mean, this could also be my, my personal ignorance, and there are just things that I'm completely missing. So this is something, and this is just, I don't, I don't know what to, like, is there something to be made of, of Cornelius who in, in the New Testament is as the centurion, the sort of other, the outsider who becomes Christian, is he, is he being used in this way in Damascus and the Umayyads? Um, so I, I'm much more comfortable with the, the social religious cr critique and I'm <laughs> hopeful or, uh, but much less sure about uh, the sort of political um, Roman versus uh, Umayyad connection. Matthias. Um, just out, out of complete ignorance, I mean, so as you say, it's admired in dates so late late seventh century. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. the only I'm thinking of the only other hagiographical text I know of that era, and that's the life of Simeon the Holy Fool. Mm -hmm. um, you know, perhaps a rather different sort of background, but there's what Simeon does there is so utterly absurd and so un unascetical. It's the sort of gulping down of beans he's eating, mm -hmm. consorting with prostitutes, this sort of thing. Do you see, I mean, moving away from politics per se, do you see a general vogue for, well, the kind of parody of asceticism, a sort of exposure maybe of actual monastic excess, you know, people aren't really living like these sort mm -hmm. of grand old men of the past or, or that sort of thing. I'm gonna say old, you know, seeming the stylite allegedly living well, well into his, um, well past a centenary year, you know, this sort of, this sort of thing. Um, I'm just, just throwing that out there, like I said, out of ignorance and probably the well-informed will shoot me down, but. Um. No, 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 I, um, I mean, my first inclination is to read this text alongside something like Leontius's Simeon the Holy Fool. And I do like to read the figure of Cornelius as a sort of figure. Um, and what's interesting about Simeon the Fool versus Theodulus the Stylite is that um, Simeon the Holy Fool's inclination to even enter the city and act the fool is that as he's praying in the desert with his companion, he comes to the realization that he's not doing anything. Like he's a monk in the middle of nowhere, but he's not doing anything. Um, and I, I'd say that's uh, in a certain sense what's going on with the critique in the life of Theodulus is these stylites are up in their pillars not doing anything. I mean, of course, there are many sources that would disagree with that, but I, I do see that sort of uh, critique and move to practice one's philosophy as being somewhat in relation. Um, that you could equate, Simeon would be the opposite of Theodulus and would in some ways be quite similar to Cornelius, although one is actually a monk and the other is some musician in the hippodrome. But the idea of secret saint doing noble actions versus ostentatious person on pillar, um, I think has some capital. So yeah, thank Thanks. you. Michelle. 
Oh, thank you. I seem to have lost my blue hand for some reason. So uh, your, your pink one does quite perfectly well. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. That was a, a, a fascinating series of texts, and I, I love the idea that it's a parody. Uh, and I have, uh, I, I don't know very much about the later period, but there are just a couple of late Roman things, uh, two things that I was so very curious about. One was that inscription, which talked about going through 32, I think, uh, turnings of the sun. The mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if that has, how that plays into anything, because was he 32 years old? Was the sun, is it just once a year or what, what is the, how yes. so let me, let's see, let me pull this up um, and share. So it was for the, for the progress thing. Yeah, so we're seeing this now, right? I hope. Yes. Okay, yeah. Passings of the sun, right? So, yeah, so th this is just a comment on how many days it took Proclus to actually um, move and presume it's unclear if moving is included in this, but uh, erect the obelisk itself in the hippodrome. And I mean, there's great, almost too much uh, concern that the, the Latin says 30 and the Greek says 32, as if this is like a real meaningful sort of difference. And, and D.A. Bus or no, uh, Domitusque, some scholars amend to it's uh, an inscription error and it should be duobus or something like this. But yeah, that's, that's what's going on here is this sort of, I mean, I guess the idea is that, uh, I mean, I've never, raised an obelisk myself, but that doing it in 32 days is quite swift is I think the idea. <laughs> oh, I see. So the, so the, the day, the sun, um, each, yeah, okay. It, that's an odd way to be counting days. It's yeah, like, yeah. It, you um, know, it's just, it's an odd, um, and since I'm interested in Sundays and sun, it's, you know, it's obviously stuck out to me that it's extremely unusual. And I wondered whether one could do more, more of that. Yeah, I mean, just, that's, just that's, to jump. Oh. Just to jump in, I mean, it seems like it must have been sitting there for a long time. I think that's the implication of the first line of both the Latin and the Greek, that it, it wasn't moved there uh, in the 30 days that it had been sitting around, but no one knew how to make it stand up until. Uh, over the course of 30 days, Proclus figured it out, you know, how, to, how to erect it as a... Right, right. Right, right. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I hadn't thought of it until just now, but of course the solar sort of connection between, especially in the Circus Maximus in Rome and by right. extension here, um, and that also in handout 10 on my, my handout, uh, Isidore Seville makes that point too. Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, this might be some sort of reference to, to the sort of Roman way of thinking about obelisks and hippodromes and Circus Maximuses too. So yeah, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. well, also, you know, there is um, a, a temple of soul in the Circus Maximus in Rome. And so this is kind of, a, you know, this is a parallel sort of reference to it. Um, and, and then uh, I see you have other hands, um, but I, I did just, um, wanted to make the point, I was very struck that you know, in light of uh, Anise, Anisia's paper, you know, in this case, you have the wife actually deterring the husband. So the conflict model has this gen nice gender reversal. It's really quite unusual. You're seeing it as parody, but I wonder um, if there are not other parallels that might be more, uh, I mean, you, you make a very good case for Perry overall, but I wonder if it's not also reflecting um, a, a topos that actually you can find in other cases where the women do succeed in deterring mm -hmm. their husband. Here. It would in be rather way. amazing if it were part of the parody. That yeah. That, that, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's so routine that the woman wants to, you know, wants right, to. Right, right, right. But I, yeah, I, I'm just wondering <laughs> if you can parallel it with other, you know. Yeah, I mean, the first that comes to mind is uh, it's the uh, text 
co-edited by Virginia Burris and Marco Conti, The Life of, it's in Latin, um, that's somewhat similar to this, um, but also certainly a part of the parody is in the, especially the sixth century tradition of stylites, the figure of the mother rather than the wife is very popular um, and important throughout the tradition. In fact, Simeon the Elder had no mother to speak of in his life after he became a monk, but that tradition gets reinserted for him because Martha, the mother of Simeon the Younger, is so important, um, and then the mother and the sisters of Olypius are so important. Olypius' sister actually becomes the abbess of his entire double monastery, um, so I think that's also um, it's tapping into that aspect that uh, stylites don't act alone, and in the recent history of stylites is that um, a number of women play very important roles and in some ways much more mobile roles because the stylite is stuck up on top that it's, it's tapping into that. <laughs> yeah, we have to look for short time to get a word in edgeways at this point, I think. Oh, thank you, Charles, for your paper. I was wondering um, about the author, actually, the sort of purported author in the text, presumably anonymous, and sort of there's another level of a kind of parody there, considering, um, you know, anonymous tracks are often parodies, has even been sort of reemphasized in the imperial period by uh, Tom Gu's author unknown. But as um, Derek Kruger has pointed out, including in the case of the text of, of Daniel the Stylite, anonymity is also considered by monastic authors to be a sort of aspect of their asceticism. And so you kind of have those two possibilities of anonymity kind of coming into conflict in that I was just sort of wondering uh, what you thought about that, particularly anything interesting about what the author says about themselves. Yeah, I mean, I, I love Kruger's book, Writing in Holiness, and um, his point of an anonymity as a sort of uh, signal of pious Christian devotion is just spot on. Um, and I mean, here, I mean, it kind of serves two functions, I think, is that, uh, I mean, one, it's a parody of that, and it's fitting the sort of genre norms, but um, it's irreverent in a number of ways, and that's also part of the joke, that it, it, it's both imitating the sort of, like, what you expect for texts like this, um, and, and turning it on its head. Um, and, and your point as to who wrote this and when, uh, I mean, I think... The Terminus Postquem is the earliest version, I think, of Olypius' life, which is around the death of Heraclius in 641, maybe. Um, but yeah, this is something that greatly troubles me. And I, I, I don't know if we'll have enough evidence at some point to, to say for certain, oh, it's you know, seventh century or, or whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, He's, seen, he, he's so well-educated, knows the history of, of the Roman Empire. He seems to have been a lawyer, and we know that um, the Eutyches had offices in the Hippodrome. He quite, like, in late antiquity, they would have had access close up to the Theodosian obelisk. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's such a great, yeah. Uh, I'll leave it at that, but that's a good question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. Uh, wonderful talk. I have a small question kind of related to or related to the figure of Procla. Um, in the Simeon the Fool, at one point he actually prays for the death of his companion's wife so that he will stop pining for her. Yeah. Um, do you see that happening here? Is Theodulos actually praying for the death of his wife or is it sort of happened sort of miraculously? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I'm always so troubled by that, that aspect of the life of the fool, and I'm always scandalized, like, when I've taught it a couple times. Um, I mean, no, in, in the text, the simple answer is no, he's not praying for his, uh, for the, the death of his wife, because part of the point is he's so foolish and kind of, like, not with it that he wouldn't even kind of think to do such a thing. Um, what's, what's quite interesting about the text is, the voice of Theodulus himself is much elided throughout. In the first half of the text, Procla does all of the talking and Theodulus speaks once. Um, so the, just the percentage of speech of Procla versus Theodulus is very lopsided. And in the second half, 
The same is true for Cornelius. Theodulus basically speaks like one and a half times, but Cornelius does all the talking. And then he also has the story within the story as well. Um, so and what's interesting is Procla makes her, her counter arguments against him. And Theodulus just, do, he doesn't respond. He just is beaten, accepts his fate. He's going to just stay in Constantinople because she proved him right or proved him wrong. And then it quite to his surprise, he falls asleep and Christ comes. And it's, I mean, that's the joke to me. It's, it's quite literally like a deus ex machina, like the saint can't even do the sorts of things that like we're, we're used to seeing in hagiography and, and Christ takes care of it. But uh, so, it, yeah. That's, no, that's fascinating. It's, it's interesting because you actually see this happening with children. You'll have some female married ascetics who um, really want to leave the world. And so they will pray and their children will die. They're okay. not praying for their death, but um, conveniently, this is how the text presents it, they die and then that sort of frees them to leave okay. their husband. Um, Interesting. Fascinating. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, thank you. That's good. But yes, quickly. Let me throw out a real world counter example. I forget which number it is. Catherine probably knows. But one of the uh, Dipioc letters of Augustine, one of the newly discovered ones, has a woman whose whole family is wiped out by, I think, some sort of illness. And she has sworn her last remaining child um, when she was an, an infant, whatever infants means, a little girl to be a virgin. And she then wants to walk it back so the girl can marry. And so she says, well, I'll be a widow. She can marry, right? And Augustine is very strongly encouraging the cleric she is consulted with not to allow this. Although there isn't an absolute line, we can, you, they can't actually stop her from doing it if she really wants to. I mean, they're not threatening some sort of ex excommunication, just moral pressure, exhortation. Anyway, just throwing that out there, you know, in, in other words, it can, it can cut the other way too, is, is, is simply a way. Mm -hmm. again, Thank you. Well, I think we're, we're drawing to the close of our session. I um, want to give the sweeper question opportunity that I promised at the beginning, that if anyone has subsequently thought of something they wanted to ask in, in the last five minutes or so of one of the speakers. This is your opportunity. So, and Charles, what's the cat's name? Oh, my cat? <laughs> His name is Jude. Love Very Jude. Good. OK, if that's, if that's <laughs> the sort of question, the burning question people need to ask. Um, it's, it's time to wrap up, but thank you all so much for just a beautiful set of papers. I think the audience may be surprised to know this was, as it were, a random session um, gathered together under this loose heading, Pagans and Christians. I don't think it felt random at all. Five beautifully polished, truly interesting papers, beautiful discussion, beautiful timekeeping. Thank you all so much. So thank you and we hope we see you all in person in San Francisco this time next year. So for now, goodbye. Bye-bye. Awesome, Thanks, hope everybody. to see you guys next year. Great yeah. job, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. Thanks very much, Catherine, great job. <laughs> thank you, Michelle. Thank you all so much. That was thank really, you. really good. Yeah, um, really fun. Really yeah. fun to do it. Worth getting up for even. <laughs> Good. I meant, well, that's the <laughs> that's yeah, high testimony. And Matthias, where are you? Are you in Oxford or are you here? I'm in Colorado right now and will be for a while because of all the sorts of delays. And there's this sort of one of these one of these sorts of long planned um, sort of visits, you know, and sorts of things that get delayed and then get extended and then get extended. And you think, oh boy, what should I be doing here? But, uh, yeah. you know. Uh, my, my concern has been right now, Oxford has four libraries allegedly open. Uh -huh. um, and I imagine they are open. What I'm not sure about is if they'll be open tomorrow right, or in three exactly. days, you know, and that sort of thing. And if they're going to close it, then I'm crammed into a little, a little house with three small children and, uh, you know, yeah. my long suffering wife trying to put up with it all. And, uh, and so let's face it, a little the UK better. is not very tempting at the moment in all sorts of ways. I mean, no, I, really, I mean, I'd really like to get back to sort of the ordinary run of things, even the sort yeah. of barely ordinary run of things we've had going for several months. But uh, yeah. it's just not, you know, and so the current plan is to go back in, in about another month um, after, well, teaching will be over for the term and, um, 
you know, that sort of thing should be a little more in gear. And there's a remote chance that they will have ended what is technically not a lockdown, but an extension of tier four restrictions to the entire country. Um, you know, so they bill it as a lockdown, but it, when you go into the fine print of the regulations, it's, it's actually something rather different. Um, yeah, Boris trying to be tough. <laughs> something <laughs> like that. I'm not sure it's, maybe, maybe the idea is just, you know, keep people from being outside too much until Brexit is <clears throat> actually right. in, in play. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, and this is a reminder that you're, I think you're all so much to be congratulated just on producing these professional polished papers in in under the constraints that we're all working under at the moment. Really, really impressive. Uh, Let it end soon. <laughs> May it end soon. <laughs> so. Yeah, so well, it's lovely to meet everybody actually. Very, really fun. So yep. yeah, it was, uh, it, it, you know, it's kind of a great respite to have it. We're for, in many ways fortunate <laughs> that we can continue to do most of, not everything, <laughs> but some, at least some of our work online. So. It's surprising, isn't it? Because it's such a, it's, it's so different gearing yourself up for an online encounter. And then once we're all in the space doing what we do, um, it actually feels not just normal, but sort of precious. It's it's really worth doing. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Well, anyway, well, though, <laughs> although you can't go out and have a coffee with somebody, <laughs> it's not, yeah. so, you know, it's something like <laughs> it's really nice to do to continue the conversation. But we do have each other's emails. That's good. So, we do. Dragons, <laughs> really good dragons. <laughs> this is yeah. our uh, our nearest substitute, I think. Yeah. Um, Say hello to Susanna for me. Let me see if we see her. I will, I will. And I think I'll see you in Poznan this summer. If we get there. If we, if we get there, right, yeah. It's very out my banning. <laughs> yeah, it will be nice. Very like. Okay. okay, take good care. Well, I'm going to declare the coffee time over for me this any right. Lovely to meet you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Bye -bye. Thank you. And thank you, Eric. Who I assume is still silently there, Eric Shell, our tech assistant. <laughs>